Welcome to a new guide on this channel, and this occasion is Syntact from Lectern. This is not a review, it's a complete deep dive guide about this device. If you like all of this, please like and subscribe, and if you have the money and you want to buy me a coffee, you can go to the links at the description. Alright, so this device, this one right here, is quite massive. So the way I planned this video is so you can watch it as if it was a course. Now we will start from the very basics and then just keep learning more and more on each section. Now everything is in chapters, so if you look uh, at the description or the timeline, you can start a new section or skip it. Still, since this device is too big to cover on one single video, I've recorded some other videos to cover very specific topics, like for example the machines that we have available on this device, the MIDI tracks and the conditionals. So you can find these guides in the cards at the top or at the links at the description of this video. Right, so first we need to learn about the patterns, the bangs and the tracks, how you know how this works and then we need to talk about the data structure. Now as soon as you turn it on you will be standing on a pattern, usually called Adriana which is the first you know the pattern that you have on this device and you just press play and it's just gonna you know it's just gonna do some playing. So on this device you have 8 banks and 16 patterns per bank and right here you have the 16 patterns and right here at the bottom you have the 8 banks. Now if I'm playing something Thing. I want to change patterns by holding this button down. You can just select one of the 16 pattern patterns we are we have on that bank. So if I go to the number two, and if I play it again, it's gonna load the pattern number two. Same if I go to pattern number three, it's gonna load the pattern number three. All right, so super cool. Now again, you have 16 patterns per bank. How can you change the banks? So you need to go to bank right here and you have the banks right here at the bottom. So you can select all the way from A to H. So if I select maybe this one, then it will ask you, dude, do you want to go to a pattern? I'm going to be saying yes, select the bank and I'm going to be selecting the pattern number one of the bank B. And if I play it, and it's going to give us something. So you always, when you navigate this device, you're going to see right there at the top where you are, where you are. In this case is B, bank B and the pattern number one. So when you're standing on a pattern, you have 12 audio tracks. So it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then it's going to be 9, 10, 11 and 12. Now the first eight, these ones on the top, are going to be digital. And the last four, these ones at the, at the bottom, are going to be analog. Now as you may know, uh, the tracks, since we have uh, 12, uh, the tracks use machines or types. And if I maybe go to this one and I go to Sin and I double tap it, it's going to give you all the options for the different machines that you can use on this device. So the ones that we have on the digital tracks are going to be always the same. You have all the same machines, but things are going to be changing when you go to the analog ones because you know this uh, uses the analog part of the of the device so if i go to this one and i double tap sin it's going to give us a lot of options all the machines the analog machines that we get uh, for electron this machines the ones that we have right here are going to be on the 9 10 and 11. now the 12 is still an analog track but this one has different machines more focused to creating symbols so in conclusion you have eight digital tracks they have the same machines this one's right here at the bottom they have the analog machines for you know kicks snares and clamps and everything else and then right here you have the symbol ones so remember you have eight different banks then you have 16 patterns per bank and then you have 12 tracks per pattern it's super simple right so let's just you know go deeper so this unit storage calls plus drive. Now this holds pretty much everything. The sounds that you will create, you will be creating the projects, the pattern and everything else. Now in the keyword right here is projects. Now when you work with the unit, you just don't have eight banks and 16 patterns each. Now the banks and the patterns belong to a project. Now, so when you turn on the device, when you, if you buy this new, you're going to be standing on bank A and the pattern number one is going to see a Juliana. So w when this loads the first time, you're going to be loading a project. So how can you see all this? So if you go right there to the settings icon, it's going to it's gonna take you to the main menu of the device. So you will need to either scroll down or scroll up with the arrows and you need to go to project and then they say yes to enter. And it's going to give you a bunch of options. Now if I say load project, it's going to give me a list of all the projects that you have created. So notice that we are standing on the one that says presets. Now this is right protected and is the one that you get by default. This is the one you get from factory. So this, this is what we are using right now. And we know that with this project, we have 
you know, a lot of different patterns already or presets created for us, so we could just, you know, see how it works, or hear how it works. But what if I want to start a new one? Well, I'm going to be going to the settings, I'm going to be going, going to projects, and you can do load project and then create new. So I'm going to start with a fresh project. Uh, it's going to ask me, do you want to save it? No. And then I'm going to be proceeding. All right. So once it says success, I'm going to say no, 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 no. And it's going to take you all the way back to the beginning. I'm going to be standing on the bank A and the pattern number one. Now notice it says untitled. And if I play this, nothing happens. And if I go to the pattern number two, we have nothing. Pattern number three, we have nothing. So it's completely empty. So, okay, so this is how it works. You work in projects. Each project has its own version of the eight banks, 16 patterns, and then uh, the 12 different tracks. And you have a total of 128 patterns per project. So if you think about this, with a single project, you could create a complete live performance because you have different versions of the banks and the all the patterns inside the banks. So you could be loading a project called Heat where everything is occupied, but then you load a different, uh, different project and you have a completely different thing. Now you can use per pattern 12 tracks. We already talk, talked about this, but per project you have access to a sound pool. Now each project can remember 128 sounds. And here is where you store the sounds and then you can quickly access to the different sounds to use it on your different patterns. We will deep dive into sounds and the sound pool in a few sections. First, I want to cover the most basic operation of the device. Since this might not be your first election device, uh, maybe you already know the most basic operations, you know, creating patterns, recording live, grid recording, how to work with the params. Maybe you already know all this. So you're going to get a little bit bored, maybe. So at the bottom on the, at the description, you have all the different categories. So you just can skip, you know, some sections and go to, you know, other sections. Okay, so let's talk about the creating patterns and we need to talk about live recording and grid recording. These ones are the main ways of creating patterns. Now, since we work with projects, banks and patterns, I want to make sure that we always start, you know, go there, always start from a clean project. I'm going to say yes, I'm going to load project and I'm going to create a new. I'm going to say no and then going to say yes. And we're going to start with a clean, you know, just a clean project. Now, when you start with the, with the, you know, clean project, you get your default kit, you know, the one that you get by default. Right here, you have a function and right there, it says metronome. If you want to enable the metronome, you press funk and you hold it. And by tapping it at the top, it says click on. The click is going to be the click track. So now it's on. If I play something, it's going to be right there in the background. So how can we record? Now, first we need to do live recording. To do live recording, you need to hold the rec, hold it, and then you tap it and it's gonna start recording. And notice that we get the click track at the back. So I'm gonna be using the number nine, which is a kick. And there you go. It's gonna record whatever you play. I don't know which, what, the, what maybe this is the clap or the snare. I'm gonna be using this one. All right. And notice it's just a little bit off. Right. So as you can hear, it's just a little bit off the grid. And this is because when you record live, pretty much, you have the quantization or the not quantization. So you can do, you can check this when you go there to hold the rack and you're about to record. Notice that I, at, the, at the top, it says rec live quantized. And then if you tap it again, it's going to say non-quantized or unquantized. So this is how you change, you know, the quantization. Now, this thing I recorded was unquantized. So to do, to clear everything, I need to be out of the rec. I'm going to do funk and then clear, which is the play and kaboom, the sequence is gone. If I play it, it's completely gone. So again, I want to check what we have. We have quantized now. So now every time I'm going to be recording something, it's going to be a little bit better because it's going to be quantized. Now, this is completely up to you. Right. 
right there in the, uh, you know, in the pocket, right in the grid. So this is completely up to you. You can use the uh, quantize on or off, uh, depending on, you know, what you want to use. So maybe some things can be quantized and some other ones can be un or not quantized. Now, when you record live, if you, uh, again, we enable this and we start recording, you know, the live recording, right there, the red, you know, the rec, it's going to be flashing. This means that you're doing live recording. Now, what if I want to keep the playback but stop recording? So what you need to do, you need to do play and it's going to, you know, keep, uh, stop recording live and just keep the playback. Another thing that you need to notice is that if I still stand on the play and I do rec, now the rec, it's, it's steady, now it's on. So this means grid recording is the other type we're going to talk about in a minute. And they're just completely different. Now, if you're doing playback and we want to live record again, instead of just tapping it, you need to hold it and then do play. All right? And this is going to, you know, start the live recording all over again. Now, another thing that you need to notice is that uh, when you uh, do playback, if you want to stop it, it's going to do that. Now, the stop is to stop, but this one, it's like the pause. As soon as I press it again, it's going to keep, you know, playback from where we paused it. All right? So, super cool. Now, as we move through the different sections, I'm going to be, uh, you know, telling you or just, uh, just throwing tiny little, you know, functions that we can use when we create projects or maybe we work with sounds and, you know, and so on and so on. Okay, so while well stopped, I'm going to be doing function and clear. This is going to clear the sequence. Now, maybe you make a mistake and you want to get it back, right? So if you just recently cleared it just like this, you can do to go to function and tap it again. And it's going to say undo pattern clear. So we're going to get it back. So you can just clear, but it's going to stay in memory. And if you want to get it back, you get it back. Now, if you start doing all the things, you will not be able to get it back. So how can we grid record? So I'm going to be going to maybe the kick. Now, if I enable this, I'm not doing play, but we could, you know, do play and the sequencer starts going. Now, what we need to do right here is to stand on a track. I was standing on the track number nine, this one. So let me, if I go out, I'm going to be standing on the kick. So when I enable grid recording, what I can do, I can, since I was standing on the, on the kick, I can select where the kick is going to be playing within the 16 steps of the sequence. So if I play it back, it's just going to be doing that. And what you could do, you can exit out of the rec, rec mode, exit, and then maybe when you record, you want to record something else, you stand on there, you enable grid recording, and then you just add it. Now, the thing is that sometimes you need to go out of rec, go in, to select maybe a different sound, and just go back to, rec, to, to grid recording. What if you don't want to do this? So I can silently, silently uh, select a soundtrack. If I go to track, it lets me select one of the tracks. I'm going to be going to the number four. That's the hi-hat on the default ki kit. So if I do something like this, you're going to be doing it. All right. So the grid recording, it's also called the edit uh, mode because, you know, when you live record something, it's going to be showing up right here on each track, everything that you just recorded. So you can go to grid recording to edit, you know, the, uh, the different steps that you recorded. So again, you just need to use this, uh, the grid recording to edit or to, you know, create a pattern. So we already know that when rec is not on, when we do funk, we are going to be clearing the whole thing. Now, I don't want to do this, so I'm going to undo. Now, also, what we can do, we can stand on a pattern or maybe a, a sound, right? Stand on a sound. I'm standing in the kick or maybe I'm going to go to the hats, to the number four. This is the hats. I want to delete whatever we uh, did for the hats. I want to delete all of this. So what you can do, you just can remove the different triggers, tricks or steps. Now, in the electron world, this is called trick and that's uh, a step. So I'm going to be using trick you now because that's the lingo, electron lingo. So again, you could do it manually, but maybe I just want to erase all everything all at once. If rec is not on again, function and clear is going to be deleting the whole thing. But if grid recording is on and you're standing on the track that you want to delete by doing funk and clear is going to clear the track. So now if, if I now play it, we just get no hi-hat. So, you know, yeah, that's how it works.
Right, so this is how you record live record or grid recording. Now you have one more mode called step recording, and I will not dive into this. Uh, it's not the most uh, popular, and it's just pretty easy to do. It's like a classic way of recording patterns, and there's a whole section in the manual of uh, you know about this. And if you're interested in this mode, go to the manual to check it out. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't, but you have uh, an explanation right there. I much prefer to keep moving to the next uh, topic because this video is just way too long. Okay, so I'm going to be clearing the whole thing. Remember, rec is off, so it's going to clear the whole pattern, right? So right there, when you go to funk and you go to metronome, if you press funk and you hold it, it's going to take you, and you need to long press, it's going to take you to the metronome menu. And you can enable the click and change some settings. Now, right here, you have the volume. Maybe you notice it's uh, maybe a little bit too low, the volume. So with the data entry encoders right here and right there, it's going to tell you which uh, encoder is going to be uh, changing, uh, you know, working for each uh, param. Right here, you have the volume. I can go all the way up and now it's going to be, you know, just a little bit better. Now with this one, you can turn it off or turn it on. So with this one, you're going to be changing the time signature. Pretty simple. Just completely up to you. Depends on what you want to use. I'm going to stay on four force. And then you have a pre-roll bars. Now maybe you don't know what pre-roll is. It's going to count before you start recording. So I'm going to be doing it right now. I'm going to be uh, setting the pre-roll to one bar. And I'm going to do live recording, right? I'm going to do live. So, and I'm going to be using maybe this one. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to say live record. Okay. So maybe you notice what happened. So when I did live record and the playback started, it will it counted one bar before starting the recording. So maybe I want to count two bars before it starts record recording. Now this is a way of you know giving you a little bit of room before uh, you start recording and you start right in the pocket. So I'm gonna be doing that in one, two, three, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Right? So, again, that's how it works. It's going to count before you start the recording. Now, to get out of this, you can say no, and it's going to take you out. And again, to go in, you long press, and you can disable the VARs if you want. And, you know, maybe disable the click from here. Again, just pressing no on most of the screens is going to take you back to home, which is, you know, this screen. So when you record something, you can offset uh, a trigger, you know, of uh, that step. So uh, I have nothing right here. You know, it's a completely empty sequence. I'm going to be uh, using the number four, which is going to be the hats. I'm going to be entering grid recording and I'm just going to maybe record something like this. And if I play it back, it's just going to sound like that. Maybe I'm going to go up in volume a little bit and I'm going to disable the metronome for now. So this is just a tiny hat. Now what you can do, you can just press and hold, and while you're just, you know, holding, the left and the right will offset, you know, the pattern or the trigger to the right, to the next step or to the previous step. And you can offset it one whole step. So if I go right there, notice that it starts sounding a little bit off grid. And you need to keep holding to see that menu, the one that we have right here. Now, if I go really crazy or something like that, it's going to start, you know, to offset all of this. We can go and you need to hold it, right? Remember always to do this. So if you go to the other side, it's offsetting this one. And, you know, we just can do different offsets. And right now I'm going really crazy on each trigger just to show you how this works. Right? So if I enable the uh, click track, you know, it's way different. So you can go a full, you know, a full step before for full after. That's how, again, how it works. So on all the different tracks, you can, you know, this, do this manually. Maybe, maybe you don't want to do it on the kick. Well, you know, I'm not going to be doing it on the kick. I'm just going to be adding the steps for the kick. And just, you know, don't do it for the kick. You know, it's super simple. Now, still, you have a main menu for the uh, for the quantization. If you go to function and you go to trigger, it's going to give you the quantize menu. And notice it says track something and then global. Okay, so I'm going to be doing track and I'm going to be standing on this one, on the uh, on the hat. And we know that this one has offsets or micro timings. That's the word for this. So we can use the data entry encoders to adjust the micro timings in a more global way. So right here, we're standing on the track number four. Now, if we go towards the all the way up, notice that the hats are right there in the grid. 
This is a way to adjust the, uh, you know, the micro timings in a more global way. If I go all the way back down, we just had what we recorded manually. You know, the adjustments we made. But this works on a per track, you know, basis. But so what you might have is different tracks with different uh, micro timings. Well, that's going to be the global. If on the global, I go all the way up, you're going to be uh, quantizing pretty much the whole pattern. That's, you know, how it is, you know, how it works. To get out of the screen, remember, no is going to always take you out. All right. So I'm going to be maybe exiting right here and just going to be playing it back. And this track is a little bit maybe too loud. I'm going to be going to amp and just, you know, go a little bit down. Just like that. We're going to talk about, you know, how to use all of this in a, in a couple minutes. So what I want to do, I want to check the tempo. So right here is your tempo menu. If you tap it, it's going to take you to the menu. Right. So once we are here, we can control the BPM, the swing and a bunch of other things. So if I go to this control, this is the one that is going to be changing the BPM. Now, this uh, scroll, this, you know, this button, uh, which is an encoder, it, it works for a bunch of things, depending on which screen you are. And this on this screen is going to be for the BPM. If I go faster, it's just going to be, you know, doing it faster. If I go slower, it's going to be and go, you know, just go and do it slower. Right. So by uh, all the encoders that you have right here, this ones and this ones, they are, uh, you know, you can push them. If you press them, it's going to be doing something. In this case, it's just loading this. Now, if I go right here back to the tempo, if I push it and keep it pushed, I can move it and notice that the BPM is just going to be going way faster. So by doing this, you can just really change the tempo in just, you know, a single, uh, you know, movement it is going to be you know fast ch changing the tempo but you need to uh, push the, uh, the the encoder and keep it hold i'm going to release it and it's going to be there the other way is just you know going to be by one bpm now when you uh, maybe when you buy this uh my what well, that was my first thought is that this buttons will be changing the bpm you know going up in tempo going down in tempo this is something related it does something like that but it's going to be doing fractions that is that we still keep stay on 15s we get to 9 and then it's going to go 116 you know 116 and it's just going to do fractions this is you know what it does the other ones, this one and this one, what they will do, they will nudge the tempo as long as you're pressing and holding. So if I press and hold, it goes up, goes a little bit faster. And when I release it, it goes back to the original tempo. And this is the same thing, but the other way around, it's going to go slower and then go back to the tempo that we had. Now, the other thing that you get is going to be the swing right there at the top. And you can go from 50 all the way up to 60. Now the swing, if you don't have a pattern that can, you know, the swing is just not going to work. So you need to add some swingable data. I'm going to be going to the hats and uh, what I'm going to be doing is grid recording. I'm going to be doing something like this, something like that. And so we can easily recognize the swing and you can go to swing and it's just going to go and do it, right? Super simple. It's just a swing, very simple, uh, very common option that you get on most sequencers. And to go back, you just can simply go back. Now, what about the tap tempo? Can you put tap tempo? Well, it says tap tempo. How can you set it up? I'm going to, you know, do some playing. I'm going to be doing funk. And by tapping the tempo, you need to do it at least four times. If not, it's just not going to work. So it's one, two, three, four, and it changes the tempo. But you need to do it four times. So yeah, you need to hold function and then do the top tempo. Now at the bottom, you have something that says function and then Y and it says global BPM. So right now, if you notice right there at the top, it says pattern. So when we change the tempo of this, we are remember working on the pattern number A and the one right there at the top. When we save the project and we save the pattern, this is going to be the tempo of this pattern. But maybe later I'm going to be changing to the pattern number two or whatever pattern. And the tempo of this one is going to be, I don't, I don't know, maybe 160. All right. So it's going to be a different tempo. And when we go back, we go back to the pattern number one and it's going to be 107 and so on and so on. So this is going to be the pattern or global. Right now we are standing on pattern mode, which means that each pattern, when we save it, is going to hold, you know, it's going to remember its own version of the tempo. And that's what, what it does by default. 
So when you change patterns, maybe the, the next pattern is going to be 160. Well, then this is going to be doing 160. But maybe what you want is you want to keep the same BPM throughout the different performances, you know, the different uh, patterns and banks and everything else within the project. So if you do funk and yes, now instead of working, you know, global, you're going to be working uh, instead of working pattern, you know, you're going to be working in global. So if I change, notice it's 120. If I change to the other pattern where we have nothing, it still stays on 120. And if I go back to the number one, it stays on 120. If I go down and go to the next pattern, is the next pattern, but it's going to be, again, 97. The other way, it doesn't care. It doesn't give an F if we are standing on a different pattern. If I go back to the pattern number one, it's going to be 107. And the pattern number two is going to be 120. So it just works per pattern and not in a global fashion. Now this might be super important and this is why I'm taking my time to explain this because if you are working with a performance you're performing live and you don't want to change the different BPMs when you change patterns, well, you will, you will need to use this. Okay, so let's talk about the retrigger. I'm going to be standing on the track number four and if you remember, this one is the hat and I'm going to be going to grid recording and adding, I'm going to be adding a lonely uh, hat right there at the beginning of the sequence. We just get a hat. Now, what we can do, we can go and enable the retrigger for this one. I'm going to be pressing that, uh, you know, trick and hold it. Now, instead of doing this and this, which uh, will, you know, adjust the micro timings, the up and the down, what they will do, they will, you know, give you the retrig menu. So right here, while you're holding, the different uh, data entries are going to be doing something. So this is going to be turning it on. And listen, right now it's a little bit different. It's just kind of a playing it twice. So this is what the retrigger is going to do. It's going to uh, remember this setting and it's just going to retrig the same uh, trigger. If I go again, I need to hold it. You need to hold it to access the menu. And when you release it, it goes away. So you need to make sure of that. So. Right now the retrigger is on, but you have a lot of options right here. So by default, this is going to be the rate, but the most important one is going to be the length and it's going to be the D one. So right now it's very short. As I keep going up, it's just going to be extending it within, you know, the sequence. And if I keep going up and up, at some point it's going to be the whole 16 steps. All right, so this is the way you can just pretty much retrigger the whole thing, or just, you know, you need to fine tune uh, all of this. I'm going to go there. Maybe I want to do it something, you know, somewhere around there. Maybe a little bit more. All right. So then you have this control and this one is going to be the rate. You can make it go, you know, slower or you just can make it go way faster. Now this is again completely up to you. Now, by default, it's going to be standing on 16s. So I'm going to be maybe going to 30 seconds. Because I like how it sounds. Now then you have something called the velocity and it's going to be the H. So on this one, what it does is going to be listening to whatever velocity you have right there on that step, on that trigger. And then if you go maybe down, what it does is going to create a kind of a fade effect. First, it starts up in velocity and then fades out. Now, if you go to the trigger, this trigger, you have the velocity right there. This is going to be the main velocity of this trigger. So it's going to take that value into the into account. Now, what if you want to do the opposite? Maybe the velocity of this trigger was, you know, very quiet all the way down. So now I can do the opposite. I can go to here and then say that the velocity is going to increase as it goes and retriggers. So it starts low in velocity and then just grows. Right? So this is how the retrigger works, you know, how you use it. And again, it's just completely up to you what you want to use, what you want to do. So that's going to be the retrigger. Remember, you need to hold it. And if you want to turn it off, you know, you're playing it and you want to turn it off, you just go there and you just, you know, turn it off. So the next loop is not going to be doing the retrig. All right, so let's talk about the mute mode. So right here, you have something that says mute mode. And I uh, have two different patterns. If I play this one, this is going to be the pattern number one of the bank number A. It doesn't matter. But if I go to the other one, it's going to be a different sequence, just a different pattern. If I go back to the previous one, it's going to be again the same, right? 
So to enter the mute mode, you need to go to function and then you need to do bank and you need to hold the function and notice that it turns green. Well, I'm going to be explaining this. So if I go to function, keep holding it and then go to bank is going to give us different shades. It's going to go to purple and then keep tapping it and it's going, to, it's going to go to green, purple and green. So green right there at the top, it says that you're standing on the global mutes and purple, it means that you're standing on the pattern mutes. And there's a difference between the pattern and the global mutes. Now, when you release it, it's going to stay locked in the mute mode. If you want to get out by function and just tapping it once when you release the function, it's going to get out of the mute mode. Now, still, this doesn't mean that you cannot use mutes. When you hold the function, it's going to give you, while you're holding, the, mo the mute mode that you are using. So for now, we're just going to be staying right there in the purple one. This is going to be the pattern mute. So if I play the track, it is just, you know, we get some kicks, some hats, and right there, something in the number eight. So what you can do now is you can mute the tracks. If I go right there, we are just muting the different tracks, muting the number one and the number four. And if you want to mute them back, or, you know, remove the mute, it just works like that. Same with this one, so I can just mute the whole track, just like doing this, and everything is going to be disabled. Right, I'm going to bring them back. So once I get out of the mute mode, you're back to the usual way, but what we can do, we can do go to function and temporarily access the mute mode and we can just, you know, disable the tracks or enable them back in. And this is very important when you're performing, super useful, this is something that you need to know and master. So when we are standing on purple, function is the pattern mute. And what's the difference between, you know, the other mute? So when you are using the other one, you know, the green mute, you're uh, in global mutes. So when you change patterns, you're going to be uh, muting the tracks for all the different patterns. And I'm just going to show you the difference. I'm going to go to the uh, pattern mute and I'm going to be uh, maybe doing some play. I'm going to be muting this and this, right? The one and the four. Now, if I change patterns and I go to the other pattern, the other pattern doesn't keep the same mutes. It's playing the 12 tracks. But maybe on this one, I just want to mute the bass. Now, if I go to the other pattern, it remember the mutes of each different pattern, one and four, and the other pattern was only the number five. So this is how it works, the mute, you know, it works with patterns. It remembers which ones are muted. Now, I'm gonna be enabling all the tracks on the different patterns, and now nothing is muted. Now, if I go to the global mute, oh, like that, I go to the global mute, which is the green one, and I'm gonna be muting the one, the four, and the five. I'm gonna be muting one, four, five. If I change patterns, this one's, this tracks will remain muted throughout the different patterns. So again, this is a very important thing because if you're working with different patterns on a performance and you want to mute them all at once, well, maybe the global mute is for you. But maybe if you want to, when you change the pattern, maybe you want to introduce, I don't know, the number five, which was something that you don't want to mute on the next pattern, then maybe you want to use the, uh, you know, the purple one, the track mutes. And notice that when we change from purple to green, it remembers the mutes. Now, I'm going to be going and enabling everything. So this is how the, you know, the uh, global and the pattern mute works. Right, so let's talk about the pattern and the track length. So, so far, we are, when we create a, you know, just a tiny pattern, I'm not going to do it right now. I'm going to maybe go to the kick, and I'm going to be adding some kicks, a four in the floor, and then I'm going to go maybe to the snare and just add a snare, and to the number four and just add some hi-hats. Something, something super simple. So when I play it back, notice that the light is just blinking on the first one. So these are your different pages. If you're working with a, you know, one page, it's going to be 16 steps. If you have 32 steps, it's going to be two lights and so on and so on, all the way up to 64. So how can we change the length of this pattern? I'm going to go to funk and when then when you go to page, you tap it and this is going to take you to the main, you know, menu of the panel length. And for now, I'm just going to be doing some playing. So right here, you change the length. You can do it manually or by doing page. This is what we'll do. It will extend it for you to 32s, 48s, and then 64. And this is the max you can do. And notice that all the lights are on. Now, by default, when you have a sequence or a pattern on the uh, 16 steps, when you do page, it's going to copy whatever you have on the 16 and take it, copy and paste it and take it to the next one and the next. 
right? So again, this is how it works by default. Now, if you're standing maybe on the 16 steps and you want to uh, adjust the length manually, you can notice that it says E, so it's going to be this knob, I'm going to be doing something manually, all right? And you can even go down and make it less, you know, less steps, and maybe eight steps, all right? Very simple. Now, uh, what you can do, I'm going to be standing on 16 for now. Notice that as I move it, the lights are, gonna, are going off and then on. And this is because you can use the steps or the tricks to adjust the length. If we have 16, uh, 16 steps, I can do maybe five and it's just going to automatically uh, do it five. And then 15 and so on. And maybe four and maybe one. Right? So it's completely up to you. It depends on, again, what you want to do. Now, if you're standing on maybe 32s, this is going to be the second page. If I do 5, it's just going to do 21. Or maybe, again, 32, 31. So yeah, you depends on which page you're standing, right? So this is, is going to do the trick or not. So for now, I'm just going to go to maybe 30 uh, second. So we have, we have the 32 steps, actually 32. Okay, so what if I want to change the resolution, right? okay so right here you have the scale and this is just gonna scale everything up now maybe i'm gonna go to 16s if i go to 16s and then i scale it up with the with the f1 with this one it's gonna be changing the speed speed on how the uh, you know the different steps get play gets played if i go to two it's like we are changing it to th uh, 30 seconds now we can go the other way and just make it you know way slower Right? A little bit faster, and so on, and so on, and so on. The max you can go is 2x. All right. So this is how you adjust the scale. Now I'm going to be going to all the way to 64. So we have a 64 steps, and to exit the screen, I'm going to say no, and it goes out. Now when I do play, when I play it, it's going to say maybe it's just a little bit too slow. I'm going to be going to maybe a little bit faster, something 120, something normal. Okay. So notice that as soon as the uh, you know the sequence go through the 64 steps, the lights right here will tell you where you are. First page, second page, third, and then fourth. All right, so this is how you know where you are. But maybe you want to edit something and you want to stay on a page to edit maybe, I don't know, maybe the snare. All right, so I'm gonna be holding the track. I'm gonna stand on the snare track. This is the snare. And how can I, you know, stay maybe on the third page? Well, you need to go to grid recording. Once you're standing there, notice that the light of the page stays on the same spot. So we are now standing on the first 16. By tapping it again, it's going to be standing on the second 16s. And, you know, so on and so on. So maybe I want to add a variation on the on the third page. Sorry, bumped the camera. So maybe I'm going to be adding a variation right there, something super obvious. So when we get to that spot, it's going to be playing the variation, right? If I get out of the quit mode, or the recording mode, it just, you know, goes to normal. It's going to not uh, show you that page. It's going to go through all the different pages, right? So for now, I'm just going to be going to that third page and grid recording is on. I'm just going to remove the variation, right? When we go to the funk and then the page, it's, uh, you know, we have the information right there It's uh, that says that 64 is the uh, length of the pattern. And this matters when you change or you uh, load or you queue different patterns. So right now, it's going to wait for 64 steps before we queue it. Now, I'm going to make it 32, so, you know, it's a little bit faster. I'm going to say no. So when I start playback, I'm going to be going and loading the second pattern. So it needs to wait for both pages for two, for, you know, this uh, 32 steps to be done before, you know, we go to the first one. You know what? I'm going to make it 64. So it's a little bit obvious and make it 64 steps. So it's four pages long. As soon as I play this, I'm going to be going to the pattern number two. Now I'm going to be going there. Now this is not, will not go instantly. It needs to wait until the whole pattern is uh, done playing before we cue the next pattern. So this is how it works by default. Whatever you have right there, you know, right there is going to await for 16 steps before it goes to the next one. Now, then when we go to page right there and if I play it back, we have something at the bottom that says per track. Now what the F is this? 
So this is called Polaritum, and right here is it's called a different way, you know, it's, that's, it's not called Polaritum. On most of the sequence sources, it's called that, but right here is going to be called per track. So what we can do, we can kind of a target a track, maybe a single track, and offset the length and the scaling. I'm going to be doing just that. I'm going to get out of here. If I play it back, remember we have, we have a hat right here on the number four. We have the kick and the snare. So for now, I'm just going to be standing on the hat track. This is going to be the, the hat. So when I do funk and I do page and I do funk and I do yes, we are going to be enabling the per track mode. So now we, we are standing on the page, you know, configuration page of the track number four. So notice at the bottom, at top, it says track number four. So we are standing on the hat track. So what we can do right here, we had 64 steps. Well, maybe we can make it a little bit, you know, and by saying function and yes, we can make it much shorter. For now, I'm just going to make it 16 steps. So it's just a little bit easier to, you know, to understand. And I'm going to be going again and enable the per track. So we have 16 steps. All everything is just doing 16 steps. But maybe the hat, I want to adjust the length and make it less. And so I'm going to be going to the number E, to the letter E. I'm going to make it maybe, I don't know, something like eight or maybe something offsetting, something like six steps. So this is going to grab the hat track and just make it six steps. And it's only doing it to the track number four, which is, you know, which are the hats. And this way you just can, you know, go to different tracks, offset the length, and this is, you know, what it's called polyrhythm, right? And you can create really interesting different patterns by offsetting the different and lengths and everything else. So you can also scale it if you want, just like, you know, the same thing we did before. I'm going to stay on 16, but maybe I just want to scale it and play 30 seconds on the hats. So while we can. Yeah. Right. Super simple. And it's only doing it to the hats, not to the other tracks. Now, if I do some playing, remember that the page will always scale the length by 16 steps. So on this one works the same. We are still, you know, doing scaling to X, but if I do page, it's gonna make it, you know, 32 steps long. And I'm gonna do no to get out of this. So notice that we are standing on the hat track and notice how the pages are going, are going really fast. And we have two pages. Not, not just one. And it's because since we have, uh, you know, more more uh, steps right here on the hat, it's just going to show you more pages. And this is going to be irrelevant in a minute. I'm going to go to the track and I'm going to go to the kick. And we know that on the kick, we only have 16 steps and we have only a single page. So now you just, you know, you access different sounds and you might, you might get different pages. So I'm going to go to funk and do page again. And I'm standing on the track number four, which was, you know, the hats. And I'm going to make it just, you know, 64 steps. I'm going to make it really long. And now we can have a need to talk about the M length and the CH length. So the hats are going to be 64 steps. We know this. So if I go no and I'm standing on the hats, notice that the lights are not really going to the three and the, and the four. It's just staying on the one and the two. And this is because the master length is a little bit different than what we are just trying to do. If I go to funk and then go to page, the master length is going to be 16. Right? So if I adjust the master length with the H1 and I just make it longer, I'm going to make it, I don't know, 32s, maybe something like that, and then say no, and I stop it. Now we're going to see that the hats go through the four different pages before restarting. Right? So if I go to the kick and I do playback, we only have one single page, right? And on the track number four, we have, you know, the four different pages. Now this gives you or introduces, um, you know, a different problem. So I'm going to stop, I'm going to do funk and I'm going to do page. So we are back to, you know, the main, uh, you know, uh, pattern page or scale page. So we are doing 64s and then we are doing 32s. And that's why we are able to see the four pages. But what if I want to do pattern and cue a different pattern? This is going to wait for 32 steps 
before you know we go to the next pattern and i can just prove this if i go to the track number nine which is the kick remember we have 16 steps so it's gonna wait for two cycles of this before we cue to the next pattern i'm gonna be playing it in three to one and as soon as i play it i'm gonna go to pattern and i'm gonna cue a different pattern i'm gonna be you know doing some uh, playing and i'm gonna cue it let us wait for two cycles before queuing the next pattern. And this is, you know, again, how it works. It is because, again, we have uh, as a length, as a master length, 32 steps. Maybe what you want to do, you want to queue the next pattern uh, after one single cycle, you know, 16 steps. Well, then again, we go to the H and I'm going to go and make it 16 steps, right? This is what we want to do. So I'm going to be saying no and get getting out of this. So if I do play and we can see that we have the 16 right there, I want to cue it to the next one. All right. So as soon as I do so at the end of the first 16, it's going to cue the next pattern. So it works. Now, the thing is that now we have a problem with the hat. With the hat. Oh, sorry. Missed uh, yeah, wrong pattern. So I'm going to go to the hat. Now with the hat, we have 64, right? So we have that, but the master length is going to be 16 if I get out. Now when I play it, we only see two pages of the hat before it re restarts. So we never get to the 3 and the 4. And this is because we are changing the master length to be 16. So we cannot see the 4 pages of the hat. How can we fix this? Because I still want to cue the next pattern after 16 steps. And this is the problem. So that's why you have the CH length. Now the CH, uh, I always confuse it for, with channel because I see uh, the the uh, you know the words, the letters CH dot, and in my mind is channel, but it's not channel. It's change, change length. So what we can do with this, I can say that the, my master length is going to be maybe 32 steps. You know what we had before. It's going to be 30 to 32. If we do something like this and we do no and then we do yes play, we can see the four pages of the hat. But the problem is that if we cue a different pattern, we need to wait for 32s, so 32 steps. So, okay. So now the channel length is going to decide when we the channel sorry and then again is going to be the change length is <laughs> going to decide how long is going to wait if we change it or we cue the next pattern so right now it's completely off now i'm going to be going to here and i'm going to make it 16. i right, it's going to make it 16. so by doing this we say that when we change it, it's going to need to wait for 16, but, you know, the master length on the pattern is, you know, 32s. So if I do no, and I get ex exit of this, I'm going to be playing it back, and as soon as I do so, I'm going to be going to the next pattern. It is changing on the first 16, and it's not waiting for 32s to, you know, cue the next pattern. So that's how it works. I'm going to be playing it. And as soon as I do so, you know, it's waiting for 16 and not 64s. Now, there's one more thing about this. Uh, ooh, I'm sorry, I'm going to go to this pattern. Uh, right here, you have the M length. What you can do with the M length, and for now, I'm just going to go and make this one off. Just going to go off. And notice how much you can do. So I'm going to be going to the M length, and I'm going to say inf. So you can do inf, which is, you know, infinite. If I go to no and play it back, we just get the pattern. It's going to go through all the different pages that you have available. And if I go to the track number, uh, the, to the kick, we only have 16 steps on that one. So inf, it means that it can do whatever you did, uh, whatever you programmed right here. But the problem now is that if I cue a different pattern, it will never cue to the next pattern. That's the way it works. It will never do it because it's, you know, inf. If I go there, it's inf. So now you can live it at inf, but then you can go to the change length. There I go. Okay, so let me stand on that pattern. I can go to the change length and make it okay. So I'm going to be waiting for 32 steps before, or maybe 16 steps before we change it. So you ch you decide your change length, but your master length, if you know, it's all the way uh, open. So uh, I'm going to be doing no and going to be proving this. I'm going to be playing it. And as soon as I do it, I change it and it just works right now it's just queuing the other pattern so this is how you know the change length the polar rhythms the math master length and the length of the of the patterns work
Right, so let's talk about some copy pasting operations, really important things that we need to know. Um, we're going to be using in, using them the whole time. I'm going to be playing and we have the dumbest pattern, you know, the one that we've been using, pretty simple. So what I want to do, I want to copy the pattern. Now you need to make sure that the rec is completely off, right? So function and rec is going to copy and you can see the functions right there at the bottom. It just copy, clear and paste. But everything depends on where you're standing, if rec is on, you know, if you have a track selected. It just works in different ways. So you need to, uh, you know, remember all of this. So rec is going is going to be off. As soon as I do function and I do copy, is going to copy the pattern. So now the the pattern it's right there in the memory. So now I can go to bank number I don't know B and then pattern number three. You know, standing on whatever we want. I'm going to be doing function with the rec off, and I'm going to be doing paste. This is going to paste the pattern. If I play it, you know, we get it. Super simple, right? So I'm going to be going to the first pattern that we have before, you know, standing on bank A, pattern number one. So what if you want to copy a track and paste it someplace else? So it's the same idea. First, you need to stand on the track that you want to copy. I'm going to go to the hats, which is the number four. So I'm standing on the number four. Now to copy the track, the rec needs to be on. So you need to be on grid recording. So function and then copy is going to copy the track. So now again, we can do the same thing. We can maybe go to the pattern number two. And when we have grid recording, I'm going to be maybe selecting whatever track. And when I do function and then I do paste, it's going to paste that track only. All right? Pretty simple. All right. So I'm going to go to bank number nine and then the, uh, you know, the, the A and the number one. And if I do it, we, we have that dumb pattern. So I'm going to do function since now we know how this works. And I'm going to make it 64 steps. All right. All right. So what if I want to copy a very specific page? So, okay, so I'm going to say no. And I'm going to go maybe to the page number, I don't know, three. And I'm going to stay on the hats. And I'm going to be doing some, you know, something that we can identify. I'm going to play it, it's page one, page two, and then the page three. All right, so I want to copy that page. All right, so when we are standing right here on grid recording mode, and we are standing on the page that we want to co we want to copy, is the same procedure. It's going to be page and then copy, and it says copy page. So now what I can do, I can maybe go to, I don't know, a different pattern, and if I'm standing on the page, on that page, I can do the same thing. I'm going to do page and I'm going to be doing paste and it's going to paste the page and, you know, we get it. It doesn't matter that we copy the third one and we paste it on the 16 of a different pattern. It's still, you know, still going to do it. All right. Okay, so you have a lot more things that you can do with patterns and sequences and, you know, copy pasting and clearing and, you know, just all that. Uh, but the thing is that some of the functions that we need to learn now uh, regarding the sequencer and everything else, we need to uh, learn some other parts because they are related to the different sections of the device. So as you can see, there's no linear way of learning this device. It's because it's super complete. You can only learn parts up to one point. You know, right now we are talking about sequencer operations, sequencer functions, and so on and so on. And then at some point to keep learning more things, you need to learn the other parts. And once you know both parts, then you can, you know, do the functions. So still remember that at the bottom on the description and on the timeline, everything is on categories, is in sections. So you can skip the part, the parts that you already know. So on the next section, we need, we really need to talk about this one because it's, you know, a big part of this device. So the params that you have right here are fundamental to adjust each track sound. Now you might have some experience in how they work, but since this is a guide, I need to at least give you an overview of each different param that we have right here. Now again, if you know them well, you can skip this section and just move on to the next one. Also on this params, with this params, you have the sin. Now the sin is going to be the machines. I'm gonna give you a tiny little overview in how this works. Uh, but the thing is that you have a million 
million machines, a million different types of, uh, you know, the uh, machines right here. Now, it would be crazy for me to go one by one and show you well, what they do, because it's going to take this, you know, uh, guide into a four hours, uh, you know, video. It's just crazy. Still, I've got your back. I've recorded a different guide, a different video, just going through the machines. And I'm going to be giving you a tour through all the different machines that you have available on this device and talking about each different control and just, you know, helping you to understand how each machine works. Now, check the links at the description or check the cards at the top. You're going to have the, uh, you're going to get the link uh, to that video right there. Now, the machines, uh, you know, deep dive video is going to be released after I release this one. So maybe you go to the cards right now or to the links and it's not there and it's because it was not yet released. But don't worry, that video is going to be there and I'm going to be releasing it in a couple of days. All right, so on the trick param, we can change the, you can change the pitch right here with the first knob. We're going to be again offsetting the pitch all the way up or we can go down in pitch. Now also you have the velocity. Now the keys by default are not velocity sensitive. So this is how you adjust the velocity for each step or each trigger. So then the length is going to be the step length. So when you add a trigger, the length, it, the length is going to decide how long that step is going to be. So for example, if I maybe go all the way down, I go to grid recording and I maybe add a couple of notes, but when it plays, it's just very short. But if I go maybe to this one and I make it super long, notice that this trigger is just way longer than this one. All right, so again, this is again how it works. So for now, I'm just going to be removing uh, all of this. Now I'm going to remove uh, this and I'm going to go back to the number six. Now, then you have something called the prob uh, probability. Now, this is a little bit different. By default, it's going to be when this is going to be playing. So if I record something right there on the number six, sometimes this is going to be playing or sometimes it will not. By default, it it's 100. So it means that it will always play. But as I go down in probability, this step, this trick, my play or not. Notice that it's not playing now. So sometimes it's going to be playing, sometimes it will not. And it will decide this every time that it encounters this step. So it's like a random function. Now, as soon as I, uh, you know, go to this trick and I press and hold it, notice that now it says cont instead of prop. So these are the conditionals. And you have a lot of options right here. Now, just like the machines video, I've recorded a different guide just to show you how all of them work, because I need to give you very specific examples. And this might, uh, you know, this takes a little while. Okay, so maybe I'm gonna go to this one. So right here, you have the LFOT and the FLTT. So every time that we record the step right here, for example, it doesn't matter, is going to be re-triggering the LFO that we have right here, or the filter that we have right here. So this is how it knows how the filter and the LFO needs to re-trigger it. So if you don't want to re-trigger the filter or the LFO, you just turn this off and the filter and the LFO will not re-trigger. This is, you know, how it works. All right, I'm gonna be removing this and going back. Then you have the P time right here and the port. So this is going to be the portamento. So you can turn portamento off and all, all of this depends on which machine you're using. Maybe it's a super percussive sound, maybe it will not make a difference. And then you have your portamento time. When you play different keys, it will just, you know, kind of a glide to the next one. So if I do something like that and I play it back, maybe I want this to be on a different key. Notice that it's doing that one, that slide. And we're going to talk about how to change the different values for each param in a minute. This is called param locking. We're going to talk about this. So notice that every time that we go to a different key, a different note, it's just gliding. So this is the portamento. If I turn it off, we just don't get it. So this decides how, you know, slow it is. Super slow, or maybe we want a short glide. All right.
Okay, so now we need to talk about the, you know, the elephant in the room. Maybe I'm going to be standing on, I'm going to still stand on this one. Or maybe I'm going to go to this one. Okay. So uh, how this works is that on each different sound, you have different machines. This is how syntax works. So I'm standing on this one and right here, you're standing on this machine. Now, if you double tap it, it's going to take you to the menu of which machines that you can use. Now, remember, you have all the way from one all the way to the eight. It's the analog section. I'm sorry, the digital section and right here below the, the, the 9, 10, 11 and 12 are going to be analogs. So you have different machines. So if I go to this one, which is the digital and I do and I double tap it, this is that we have a, an option is going to be bass drum modern. Then if I go to the next one, it's going to sound different and each machine will have its own properties and different params. So if I go to the this one, uh, it's going to give you the different params of that machine. But if I change the machine to something completely different like that, you will have a different set of params because it's a different, you know, it's a different sound engine. And this is why I'm not covering all the machines on this guide because you have a million. Now on the digital tracks on this ones, the ones at the top, you have one, two, three, four, then five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, you already have 10 and then you have uh, 11 and then you have the MIDI. So when you go to MIDI, this track now it's going to be a MIDI track. So you can just, you know, use it with uh, maybe a DAW or maybe send MIDI data from this device. And as you could guess, I've recorded a guide that is going to be released in a few days uh, talking about, uh, you know, the different how we can use this device just as a MIDI, as a MIDI controller or maybe change the tracks to use just MIDI. All the different, all the digital ones are going to be the same. If I go to this one is digital and I do double tap, it is that, you know, it has the same, the same machines. Now there is a difference between the digitals and the analogs. If I go to this one, this one is analog. And right here you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, a million different machines and they are all different from the digital ones, because this is the analog circuit. So as you can see, you have like 25 or uh, a little bit more uh, uh, machines uh, that you can use. And not only that, this one will hold all of these different machines, but the 10 is going to, you know, hold the same machines, you know, double tap, you have the same machines, the 11, same machines, as you can see, you know, have the same things, but then the 12 is going to be the symbol engine, the symbol machine. So the number 12 is only going to have machines dedicated for symbols, pretty much. So yeah, it's a pretty, you know, complete and, you know, kind of a long, let's say, uh, device. And also you have different params on most of the machines. So again, if you want to understand each machine, check the links in the description. I've recorded that guide. It took a long time because it's like 25, 26 machines. But if you want to know how to, you know, how to uh, use them, just go to that video. All right. So let's just keep moving forward. Whenever you want to change a machine, right? You stand right there, you double tap it, you change your machine, and then whatever param that you have available, maybe on this one, we don't have a lot. You stand there, whatever param that you have, you just tweak it just to, you know, to do whatever it is that you want to do for, for that one, right? All right, so let me just give you a couple tips. I'm going to be playing this. Notice I changed everything and now it's kind of a sustaining. I'm not playing it. So to double stop the, to stop the uh, playback engine, you just double tap the stop and it's just going to stop playing it. All right, it's going to stop everything. Now, another thing that you do, maybe you don't want whatever you did, so you can reset uh, the params on this one. So what you can do, you can go to that param, I'm going to be pressing holding, and then I'm going to be doing clear. And it's going to clear, I'm going to stop it, all the settings I changed for that machine. But maybe I want to go back to whatever I had before. So I'm going to be doing track, I'm going to hold the track, and I'm going to be selecting the kick track, the one I want to reset. So now I'm going to be going to no, and notice that it says track sound reloaded. I'm going to release it, and we got this, we get the sound back. Now let's say, let's say that maybe I'm going to go to the number six. I'm going to be doing some things on the filter. We're going to talk about this in a minute. So we have something and I just changed the settings for that, you know, for that one. So you can go to filter and then say clear and it's just going to clear the page for the filter. So we are back to whatever we have from default. Now there's one difference between the yes and the no. So again, I'm going to be doing the same, something like that. 
and maybe more envelope. We're going to talk about this in a minute. So if I do the same thing, filter, but then I say no, notice that it's uh, taking me to the same. It's just, you know, we are getting the same. We are getting the same result. Now, the yes and the no, uh, they work. Th th these ones are called temporary safes. So the filter and so when you hold the param and you do clear, it's going to clear it. But when you do filter and then you do no, it's going to recall the last state, you know, whatever settings that you had right here when you saved the pattern. So it's just reloading the params of your last save. Uh, so again, if you have a patch and you saved something and you make some changes and then you regret all of this and you want to get it back, you don't go to clear because it's going to reset everything. You go to function and, you know, you go to the uh, param, hold it and then no, and it's going to reset it to whatever you have in uh, memory. Okay, so let's just keep going. Uh, we already know this. I'm going to be going to the filter. So the filter is uh, just like a, any other standard synth filter. And it's a pretty simple. You get an envelope right here at the top. You have your attack, you have your decay, you have your sustain and your release. I'm not going to be explaining how an ADSR works. You can go to the web and type how an ADSR works and you're going to find a lot of explanations. But right here, this is your envelope. So this one is going to be doing the frequency cut. You know, you're going to be cutting frequencies. You have the resonance, you can boost at the breakpoint. So again, it works just like any other filter. Now you have different types for the filter. You have a low pass, you have a high pass, which you're, which you're going to be cutting the, the lows. Still, you can do resonance. And then you have an EQ1. So EQ, the and you have EQ1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. All of these ones, what they do, they're going to be adding a peak or you can attenuate at that point. And the different values is going to be how narrow that peak, peak or you know attenuation or boost is going to be. Now, and this is what you get. And I'm going to tell you something relevant in a minute. So I'm going to be doing some cutoff. And this is the how much of whatever it is that you're doing with the envelope you want to uh, use. So notice it's doing that modulation. Maybe I'm going to be, make it a little bit more obvious. I'm going to go full on the envelope. Notice that we get that wow. Right. So this is how the, the filter works. Now there's a lot more to the filter. I'm going to be expanding it much later. There's a section at the end of this video that says filter and LFO. And I'm going to provide different examples for the filter. Now, if you tap it again, it's going to take you to the next page. So notice that you get a different filter right here. And it's like a secondary filter. Again, I'm going to be, be expanding this, uh, expanding on this at the end of this video. So it's just going to be like a second filter. Notice that I'm chopping the lows. Is a yeah, it's just a filter for high pass and low pass in parallel. Then you have a delay, so you can delay your ADSR. And then you have something that says a fen, fen or, or something like that. It's going to be filter envelope reset. I'm going to be talking about this feature on the next section. Actually, this is the topic of the next section. So I'm going to be going to filter, hold it. Remember, I'm going to be doing clear just to clear the, uh, you know, the param page. And I'm going to move on to the amp again. Remember the filter at the end of the uh, the video. I'm going to be expanding on the filter and on the LFO. I'm going to go to the amp. And this is the amp section. You know, the right here, you control how the volume goes out of each soundtrack. So you get your uh, envelope right here. You have your attack right there. Then you have your decay, as you know, as you can see, your sustain and your release. So you have a good old common ADSR. So if I play it, maybe if I add a lot of attack, it's going to be a little bit more obvious. So right here, we control how the volume goes out of each track. That's pretty simple and understandable. I'm going to go all the way up. So right there, you decide how much signal you sent to the delay. Maybe going to go up in volume just a little bit. That is that we get it. And this is going to be how much you're going to be sending to the reverb. Maybe I'm going to be getting uh, all the delay off. No reverb. Right, so this is how we do it. Now, maybe you're you're wondering, oh, do we get a reverb and a delay for each track independently? No, the delay and the reverb are globals. So if you're sending, these are sent. So whatever you do right here, you're sending it to uh, a global delay and reverb, uh, you know, processing, right? So that's how it works. Now, 
I'm going to be doing play. Then you get your pan all the way to the right and all the way to the left. Right. So then you have so then you have your volume. I'm going to maybe stand right there in the center. Now you have your volume. Now, as you can see on this uh, on this device, you have different uh, different stages for the volume. So first you have the velocity. That is going to be kind of a work as a volume. It's not a volume, it's just, you know, going to work like it. So then you have the filter. No, the amp is going to be your second stage. So you can go down in volume on the amp or go up. But you also have the level right here. So this is going to be the level of your track. It's not what comes out of the amp. So this is going to be handling the level of the track. Right, so different, you know, gain, gain uh, stages. Now on the amp, if you tap it again, it's going to take you to the next page. So you can use, uh, as you see right here, a common good old ADSR, or the other one is going to be all the way down is going to be the AHD, which is attack, hold, and decay. Just you know, different envelopes. Now this one is going to be the amp envelope reset. So we're going to talk about this on the next section and then you have your routing and this belongs to the effects track and the effects you know that you have right here again we will talk about this in a in a, in a couple minutes so the next one is going to be the lfo right so the lfo is just going to be an lfo you have your speed your uh you can multiply the speed by some fashion you can fade in or you can fade out you assert, you select your destination, which thing you want to modulate, right? Pretty simple. And then you have your waveforms. You can uh, you can set the face of the waveform, how it's going to be reactive to, you know, that waveform, and then how much modulation you want to do. Now, again, at the end of this video, I'm going to be covering the filter and the LFO in depth. So we're going to go one by one and create an example with all the different prams. So these are your different params for all your different tracks, right? So you decide how you trigger when you add it to a sequence, right? So this is what's going to be, you know, controlling pretty much all that. Which machine, what was the thing that's going to be producing the sound? If you want to do some filtering, how is going to go out in volume? If you want to do delay or reverb or pan it, right? And then if you want to run some modulation, you have the LFO and just, you know, for something for you to notice is that is that if you tap the LFO again, it says LFO two of two. So you have two LFOs per track, right? which is something super cool. OK, so let's talk about the uh, the fern that we have right here, which is the filter envelope reset and then the amp envelope reset. Now, this is very simple, but, you know, I need to give you an example. Now, this is a feature that was added on the last firmware update of this device. So it's a pretty simple thing, but, you know, I need to give you an example. So I'm going to go to the filter and I'm going to be using the trick number six on the default kit. So, so it's just a synth sound and I'm going to be doing great recording and I'm going to add it to the one and I'm going to be adding it to the nine. So if I play this, it's going to sound like that, right? So uh, just pretty simple. Now I'm going to be going to the trick and I'm going to be making whatever it is that we are doing right here a lot longer. So if I go up in the land, notice that it's going to be really long. This is still, you know, triggering every time that we encounter the one or the nine. I will go to the filter and I want to do some filtering. And I'm going to be doing something like that. I'm going to add a little bit of resonance. And right now you just don't need to do it with me. You just need to watch. And I'm going to be using the envelope, right? So I'm doing full envelope modulation and I'm doing this and modulating the, uh, with, the, with the envelope like that. And every time that we hit the one and the nine, we hit this, you know, we hear the modulation doing this, right? Pretty simple. Now, if I go to the filter, it says and it's uh, and it's off. So what this means is that every time that we hit the uh, trigger, the envelope will be resetting or not. Right now, it's not resetting and I'm going to be showing you a problem. I'm going to be adding a bunch of attack. All right, I'm going to be doing something like that. And maybe I'm going to make it a little bit more obvious on the resonance. So I'm going to be playing. Can you notice the problem? Now the envelope, since I have a lot of attack, it's super slow. So when this one is playing, 
The envelope is super slow, but when this is playing, the envelope is still going up, it's not done doing its job. So, whenever we encounter the step number 9, the, the envelope will not reset. And this is why this is called Filter Envelope Reset. The filter is going to be doing whatever it's doing at that point in time. So, if I go to uh, this one, and I'm maybe it's going to stop it for now, and then turn it on, every time that it finds a trigger, the envelope that we have right there is going to be reset. So, I'm going to be playing it. Now, notice the difference? Start all the way from the beginning of the envelope, doing the slow attack, and same thing here. I go there and turn it off. It's very different. Now, all of this depends on the sound that you're using, and it depends, you know, what you want to, what you, what you want to do, right? So I'm going to be going to filter and I'm going to say no, just to reset the filter page. Now, if I go to the amp and tap it again, go to the second page, we have the same option and by default, this one is on. Now, remember that this is the one that controls the, how the volume goes out. So every time that we find a trigger, uh, the envelope is going to be triggered again. This is because, you know, this is why if I add a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of attack and something like that, every time it finds a trigger, the envelope just resets. Now, if I turn it off, if I go there, this is just super slow and it's not resetting. I'm going to make it more obvious. Maybe I'm going to be doing something like that. And I'm going to stop and play it back. This is super slow. It goes up in volume in time. Right? And it's because the envelope is just not resetting when it reached the next the, the next one. Now again, all this depends on what you want to do, which uh, which sound you're working, what is the envelope uh, values and everything else. Okay, so let's talk about something else since now we know all the different params, you know, what we can do with them. We can talk about the chromatic mode. So, uh, right here, I'm going to be standing on the number six, right? The number six. Now, by doing function and then going to the track right here, you're going to be enabling the chromatic mode. And it says key, key B on, so it's keyboard on and it says chromatic. So, the layout for your keys is going to change and what you get is a keyboard. So, the black keys and all the different white keys that you have right there. Now the up and down will just go to different octaves and you can of course record this live. If I just do tap this and you know record it, it's unquantized, I'm gonna be quantizing it. I can So I'm just gonna, you know, clear it. So this is what you, you know, what you can do. You can use whatever sound that you have in a chromatic fashion. Now we have a lot more. If I go to function, press and hold, and then go to track and long press, is going to give me the, the menu for the chromatic mode, for the keyboard. As we can see, you know, we can see a, we can see a representation of whatever it is that we are playing. But this is not the most important part. The important part is whatever we have right here at the bottom. We have we can choose the scale. So if I go to the scale, you, right now it's chromatic. So it's all the white keys and the black keys. But if I select a different scale, some of the uh, you know the uh, the keys are going to be off, and it's because it will let you only play the keys that belong to a very specific scale. Lydian, Mixolydian. This is the minor. So. You have a million scales, and some of them are super weird, so you cannot complain about this one. You have a lot of scale, not just, you know, four or five scales, you have a lot. And you even get the pentatonic, you know? So, it's a pretty cool thing. Now, if I, I'm gonna go to whatever, Dorian, right? So, this is my Dorian scale, pretty much, and the root is very important for scale. So, right here, you're gonna be setting your root, and depends on which root you're just working with, it's gonna show you different, you know, variations of the keyboard, right? So, again, just super simple. You select your root, and then you choose the scale you want to work with, and then you just... 
you just record it. Another thing that you get option right here is the keyboard fold. So this is the main layout of the of the keyboard right here, the black keys at the top, the white keys at the bottom. But what you can do, you can just change it to the other mode. And this is going to give you maybe the camera again is not so generous with the lights. So this is blue and it's the root. Whatever, whenever you see blue, it's going to be the root. And you can do two octaves. And this one right here, it doesn't look blue on the camera, but it's blue. And this one is blue as well. So you can, you get your Dorian scale starting on C4. So this is going to be C. And this is just going to be the scale all the way up to one octave higher. Now this is the same than this one. Notice it's the same. And then it's going to be one octave higher and then one higher, right? So again, it's just um, it's just a different uh, different layouts layouts for the keyboard. Depends on what you want to do. If you want to fool around on your just your octave on this octave, well, you can do it like that. But then you, if you want to go up, you need to change it. If you want to go down, you need to change it. With the other mode, you have one octave and the next one, the next one right there at the top. So as we know, when we stand in, on a track, we can just go to the scene, select the machine, and we can tweak whatever sound that we, you know, we want to get. We tweak it and we get the sound that we like. This is like the main power of uh, Syntact, you know, versatility in creating sounds. So it makes sense that we can save this sounds and we can load the sounds. Now you have many ways of doing this. So I'm going to be standing on a track, maybe on that track. Now what you can do, you need to go to function and then you need to move this knob, which is going to take you to the sound browser. So we are standing on the track. I'm going to do funk, hold it, and then I'm going to move it. And notice it's giving us a list. Now I can remove, I can stop holding the funk and this will just take you to the list. You can use the data entry, the level data uh, to navigate the list, or you just can use the arrows. By doing funk and yes, it's going to be letting you audition whatever, you know, that track is doing. Still, by pressing the trigger, you can... You can audition, audition the different sounds. And also, if you go to chromatic mode, notice that right now we are in chromatic, and the sound kind of a... it's a kick bass, but it will let you audition the sound by, you know, using different different keys. So I'm going to get out of the chromatic mode and that's the way it works. You go to the sound browser, you just audition your sound and let me just find maybe a sound that, you know, maybe, ah, maybe I like that one. So this is the sound I want. I'm going to be doing yes. And once I do so, that sound now is going to be part of my kit. Now, a sound, it's like a preset. It's just like a preset. It's going to bring that sound to the track and all the configurations that we have for the trigger, the filter, the amp and everything else is going to bring it along to our pattern that, you know, works inside of a project. Everything works inside of a project. So if I wanted to, maybe I can go to the filter and just mess around with that patch, you know, with that preset. This will not affect the saved sound. So if I save the project, this changes that we made will only live within the pattern and the project. So now how this works, and I'm going to go back again to funk and go to the manager. Now this manager is the easy sound manager and how it works is that, you know, the sounds, how they get stored, it's in banks, just like, you know, the patterns. So as you can see right here, we are starting on the A2, right? So if I do function, we can go in larger numbers. With the uh, level data or with the arrows, you can go all the way down. And if I go all the way down, notice that it's just kind of uh, taking us to all the different sounds that you have available. It's just pretty simple. Now, the thing is that how this machine works, it's storing by banks. Notice it says B, then A and C and so on. So if you're standing here, if you hold the bank, you can maybe go to the bank number A and now it will show you the sounds that you have available on the bank A. Maybe the sounds on the bank B, notice that we get the B, the C, the D and all the way up. Now you have a lot of default presets. Notice we are on the F and we still have a lot of presets. So per bank, you can store and load up to 255 different sounds. And maybe on the uh, last banks, you know, it's going to be completely empty because, you know, there's nothing there. So you need to hold the bank again to change the different banks. 
So that's it, you know, you go to the different banks, you choose the sound that you like, and then you do yes to to bring or to load that sound to whatever track is that you're using. One thing that you can do right here when you're standing on the sound browser, you can go to the left. So when you go to the left, you can, you can see different options. It's gonna say view pool. We're gonna talk about the pool in a minute. So uh, we get to sort ABC. It's gonna sort it by, you know, ABC. Then we can filter. So if I do yes, it will ask you, okay, so which text you want to uh, search for? So when you save a sound, you can save it with tags. So let's say I want to bring kick sounds. I'm gonna say kick and it's going to show you only the sounds that have a, you know, that are kicks, you know, they have a kick sound. Uh, you can filter by many tags, maybe kick and the rim. It's going to bring you the sounds that match that criteria. In this case, there's there are no matches. So you can go to filter and just remove the different filters or you just can do clear to remove all the filters. So also what you can do, you can go to search and this is going to be a keyword. You can enter a keyword and it's just going to search for that keyword only. All right. So, you know, just really a very easy way to finding sounds and loading them to your pattern. Now, let me show you one more thing that you really need to be aware of. I'm going to be standing on the digital track. As soon as I move so, right, it's going to give us the browser. Now, remember that with banks, we can navigate to different banks. We already talked about this. Now, by default, again, if I uh, just type, uh, press one of the banks, it's going to take you there. If I uh, tap the red one, it's going to show you all the sounds that you have for, you know, whatever. So if I do function and go all the way up, I'm going to be going all the way up. So I'm standing on a digital digital track. Notice it says 002, right? So it's not giving me the 001. What the F is going on? So if I do something like this and I try to load it to that one, it's just going to work. Now, where is the 001? So if I stand on this one and I do function, is going to give me the hidden kick the zero zero one. Why? So the thing is that uh, when you are working with the sound, you want to load a sound, maybe that sound is for one of the analog different tracks. So you cannot load an analog track to a digital track because it uses machines that belong to the analog section. And same thing but backwards. You cannot load a digital sound or a digital machine uh, on an analog track. Okay, so, you know, that's it. Well, not really. If you go to, again to Funk, this is the easy manager. It's the easy way of fi finding sounds. Now you have a more advanced way of fi finding sounds. You can go to No and Get Out. By doing Funk and then going to the triple dot is going to take you to the manager. And you have several options. Set up Sound Browser. The Sound Browser is what we've been using. But then you have something that says Sound Manager. So if I go there, you're going to find a different interface. And this is the main advanced sound manager. Right here, you're not going to be only loading sounds. You're going to be creating, deleting, uh, moving. You're going to, you know, it's just a more advanced section. So you can see all the names and everything else still, it still works the same. Maybe I'm going to be standing right here and I can just maybe go to a different bank or just see all at once. And right here, since you are on the main manager, notice that we get the hidden kick. I'm going to be standing on a digital track and I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to attempt to load that kick. So I can, I can say yes and it's going to add a tick, you know, there. And if I go to the right, it's going to give you a lot more options right there to the right. It is because, again, this is like the main sound manager. You can copy this patch to a different place. You can save it. You can rename it, edit the text, delete it. So you can perform several tasks. Now, I'm going to be loading it to track. So I'm trying to load an analog patch to a digital track. I'm going to say yes. And it says yes. And it's going to say error. It is because you cannot load an analog to a digital. Now, what you can do on this one, again, you can select maybe one, but you can select two or three or four. You can select as many as you wish. And it's because when you select many, you can perform actions like delete them all, maybe uh, copy them or editing the tags all at once. You can edit many sounds at once. Remember, this is the advanced sound manager.
Now still, if you go to the left, you can do the same thing you can do with the sound browser. You can view the pool. We're going to talk about the pool in a minute, but you can sort it, you can filter and you can search by keyword. Now still, uh, if you connect this uh, through the USB, you know, to your computer, you have a, an app just to manage all the different sounds on a more, you know, easy way, let's say. But the fact that you have right here the sound manager available for you on the device and you don't need to connect it to a computer, you can perform tasks like, you know, reordering or maybe saving them to a different bank or just copying and pasting and deleting. It's just a, it's just a great thing to have that you don't need a computer connected through a USB to do all this, uh, these operations. And with some other gear, you just don't get these options, but you get it on the Syntact, right? So right here, it works just like on the other place, the sound browser. If I'm standing, I'm standing on the analog one, the nine. If I do function and yes, I can uh, audition this. But if I go to this one, it just cannot be loaded to active track because this is an analog patch and I'm using the uh, analog, an analog track. So I'm gonna need to change this to a digital and then and only then we can audition. All right, so right here, you're gonna be just managing your whole sounds, right? So I'm gonna be going all the way to no. Now I'm gonna go to function and again, triple dot. This button calls the song mode, but it takes you to, you know, the uh, the, the main screen of sounds. So you have a bunch, uh, but a couple more options. You have a load sound. So if I go to load sound, this is gonna give us the same manager than before. And it's just pretty much the same thing. But if I go to the right, we get nothing. If I go to the left, we just, you know, we just don't get anything. Now on this one, what we can do, we can just maybe select a sound. And then when you say yes, and you select that sound, it's gonna ask you, where do you want to load it? So maybe I'm gonna be putting this on the number one, right? All right, so done. That's gonna be the sound for this one. Maybe I want to audition this one. That's an analog track, an analog track. Well, you know, I'm gonna do analog. I want to change to an analog track. I'm gonna do function yes, and I want to load it. I'm gonna, see, I'm gonna say yes, and it's gonna ask me, where do you want to load it on the tracks available? Nine, 10, or 11. And I do nine, and it's gonna load it there. So it's kind of a fast way to loading the sounds to different, different tracks. All right, so I'm gonna go to no, and then you have more options all the way at the bottom. So it says uh, rename sound. So, okay, so let's say I'm standing on that sound. I can go and rename the track sound, and this is gonna be the track sound. You can just rename it from here. Pretty self-explanatory. I can maybe init a track sound. So this one has a set of params, right? Because we, uh, we, we brought a sound right here. So by going here, I can reset the params that we have for that sound it will still keep the, keep the same machine but all the properties that we have right here are going to be reset uh, back to the default you know positions all right so what else can we do i'm going to go to function and then song mode we can save sound this is the topic of the ne next section and uh, you know we have the setup now i'm not going to i'm not going to dive into this because it's you know pretty long but right here is the setup of whatever sound track that you're using you're working Working with so you can you know adjust the octave you're working with if you want legato change the velocity the the filter key tracking so you have a bunch of options so just to give you an example let's say that if you're using a, a midi keyboard you can go to the modulation wheel right here it's just modulation wheel i'm going to say yes and you can choose different sources and with your uh, mod wheel of your keyboard you're just going to be able to modulate the you know the, this different params uh, the different values that you select right there uh, that you have on the params right here just with your mod will but you need to go to the setup to do it right so I'm not again I'm not going to dive into this if you want me to dive into this let me know and I can create a video for you right so what if we want to save a sound to uh, use it later we know how to load sounds and how the manager works. But how can we save it? So I'm gonna be, I don't know, I'm gonna go to that one. And I'm gonna do sin, and I'm maybe gonna be changing it to chord. So now it's gonna be that chord, I'm gonna be adding a little bit of modulation. I'm just changing the params to something, to something. There. I'm gonna be doing envelope. All right, so uh, that's fine. Let's say that this sound is the best sound I've ever created, and I want to store it to use it later. How can we do this? So we go to function, and then we go to song mode right there. And you have, again, mo more options, and you have the 
easy way of saving, which is going to be save sound. If I go to save sound, it will ask you, where do you want to put it? Now, some sounds, as you can see, you have an icon before the name and after the uh, number, and it's because these are right protect protected. You cannot delete them and you cannot erase them. You cannot do anything because they you cannot override them. These are the default presets. Now, I'm going to need to go to a bank where I have an empty spot where I can save it. Maybe I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to, I don't know, right here to the 14th. And if you go all the way down, you're going to find some empty spots. Now, you do get a lot of uh, sounds from factory, and it's a very cool thing. I'm going to go function and find an empty spot. It's like, you know, when you have a car and you need to find spot. So I'm going to be saving it there. It's just an empty space. I'm going to say yes. And then you will need to change the name and, you know, do everything else. Now, just to, just a, you know, a cool, you know, tip right here at the bottom. It says all the things that you can do. You move the cursor, but you can delete by doing function and then no, and it's going to delete everything. Also, by holding the function, you just can use the keyboard, the keypad, just like this. And I'm going to call it, I don't know. And there we go. So once we select the name, I'm going to be saying uh, yes to continue the saving. And it's going to take you to the text. So you can save it without tax, but you know, my recommendation is to save it with tax. So let's say that this one is going to be, uh, I don't know, a chord and then I don't know, a synth. So we can select many tax at once. Now, once we are ready, we can go all the way at the bottom. We can reset this. We can clear this or we can save it. I want to save it. Oh, made a mistake. So I'm going to enter again and I'm going to be selecting the, uh, the chord, the synth, and I'm going to save it. So you have the save option right here at the top. I pressed no by mistake. And uh, then at the bottom, you have the save here. So I'm going to be saying yes. So once we do so, it's going to be P pizza and then synth and chord. So you can use it uh, on different projects in different, you know, locations. Okay, so we need to start with sound locks and param locks. If you don't know what locks are on the Electron world, you're missing on, you know, something important. So watch this section. So, okay. So first we need to start with sound locks. We can do sounds and params lock, param locks. So I'm going to start with sounds, but first I need to make sure, I'm going to make sure that you and we start with a new clean project. Now, you, if you don't want to, you know, that, that's fine. But I'm going to be starting with the default kit. Okay, so I'm going to be standing on one of uh, the tracks, maybe the one, remember, is the digital, and this one is the analog. So what I want to do, I want to go to the sound manager. So on the sound manager, I want to load many sounds at once. So we are working with the default kit, but, you know, we want to load many other sounds. So I'm going to be going to, yes, I'm going to go to the sound manager. Now, we can filter by sound if you wish. I'm going to be maybe going to something more, I don't know, something noticeable, like a synth sound. And I'm going to be standing right here. Now, I'm going to be doing function. Now, we are standing on uh, an analog track. I'm going to be going to a digital. Maybe we can do it there. So, we can audition the different sounds, right? Okay, that was an analog one. So, I'm going to be going there. I'm going to be selecting one. I'm going to select two. I'm going to select three and four. So, okay, I'm selecting four different sounds. So what we can do now, we can grab this uh, four different sounds and add them to a sound pool. So this is where we talk about the sound pool to do the sound locking. So when you have your sample selected, if you change banks, it's going to deselect it. So you need to stay on the same page. If I go here and say copy to, notice that it gives you different options because we are uh, doing bulk actions. I'm going to be copying to. So when you go to copy to, it's going to say sound pool, and then, you know, you can copy paste it to a different, different places. But in this case, we care about the sound pool. So the sound pool is going to be a list where we can access within the project. So if we are working with the project, we enter the sound pool and whatever we add to the sound pool, we can use it. That's the main plan. So I'm going to go to sound pool and it's going to say four sounds copied. Okay, so I'm going to be going no, 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 and get out of this screen. And remember, we can do it to any of the tracks. Now, one thing that you need to notice is that when we import the sounds, this one, this sound stays stays the same. You know, it's just the default bass drum that we get with the default kit. Okay, so I'm going to be 
doing rec. And right now, again, you just don't need to do it with me, you just need to pay attention. I'm gonna be entering grid recording, I'm standing on this track, so I'm gonna be adding a step right there, right there, and I don't know, right there. Okay, if I play it, we get something like that. Now what if I wanted to maybe play a sound here, play a different sound here, a different one here, and a different one here? What if I wanted to do something like that? So we can. So when we select this, uh, this is the way we do sound locking and param locks. So when you hold the trigger right here, you can change whatever param that we have right here, or you can ch choose one of the sounds that you added to the sound pool. So to enter the sound pool, you need to hold the trigger and when you move this, it's gonna give you, you know, options of the sounds that you added to the sound pool. So maybe the first one is gonna be doing the first sound that we imported. This trick is gonna be doing the second one. This one is gonna be doing the third one. And the number 13 is gonna be doing the fourth one. And is that on each trigger, we are loading and just, you know, getting different sounds for the same track, right? So this is called, this is called sound locking. Each trick is going to be loading whatever we had on the sound pool. And this is a nice way to add a little bit of variation because maybe you have a track where you use the same sound, but maybe at some point you want to change it to a different sound. So you can do this by using sound locks. Now the sound pool that it shows right there, it's uh, it's uh, per project. So whenever you import them, they are going to be stored within the project when you save the project. So always remember to save uh, the project, right? If not, you're just gonna lose things when you turn it off and you turn it back on. You always need to, re to save the project. So if you press and hold each, you know, each different sound, it's gonna tell you which sound that you're using. I'm gonna go and select the first one. So this one is gonna be the one, this one is gonna be the two, this one is gonna be the three, and behind the scenes is showing you right here the configuration for the different you know, different presets that we are just bringing. And you can, you know, adjust them if you wanted to. We're gonna talk about that because that's called param locking. So yeah, you can just, you know, do really cool things. A lot of variation to your patterns by uh, using the sound pole. Now, how can you remove whatever it is that you did? Well, if you don't want to sound the lock, you just can go to track sound and it's just gonna be whatever you had on the track, right? Yeah, it just can remove it that way. We're gonna be maybe going to track sound and it's kick, kick, sound, sound. If you want to remove everything that you did, just removing the uh, trick and adding this again, it's just gonna default it, you know, back to default, right? So since we can hold it and change the sound, what we can do, we can still, you know, hold it, but change the params. Now to do this, just to show you this, I'm gonna be maybe going I'm gonna go to this one. I'm gonna go to this sound, to the number six. So uh, I'm gonna be adding some steps, maybe right here, right here, right here. And what we can do again is just the same idea. I can go to this one and we can go to all the different params that we have right here and change the different values. Every time that it reaches this section is gonna be uh, playing the changes and not the default sound. So let's say on this one, I'm gonna be doing a little bit of filtering like this, maybe I'm gonna be adding another step right here, but this one is gonna be really open, something like that. This one is gonna be really closed, and we can, you know, maybe add a, an envelope right there on the different triggers, and you just, you know, maybe this one is gonna be a delay and reverb, and again, a little bit of filter. So this is how you do program locking. You just go to each trigger, you know, each uh, step or button, whatever you want to call it, and you change the params by pressing holding and just moving it. So I'm gonna just keep going. Maybe on this one, I'm gonna do a little bit of that, a little bit of that, and maybe the amp, a little bit of reverb, and I'm gonna just make it wild on the delay and the reverb. And on this one, same thing, I'm gonna do a little bit of resonance and envelope, and if I play it back, is that we get a lot of different movements with the same sound. That's that's the plan, right? That's what we want to do. So on this one, you know, I'm gonna go to this and go to the filter and do something a little bit more obvious. All right. So 
you go one by one and you change the params. This is called param locking. Now I'm going to go to the number five and maybe record something simple right there. And I'm just going to show you something else on this one. Again, I'm going to be doing some param locking, but I'm going to do something simple. I'm going to do something like that. And on this one, I'm going to be doing something like that as well. And you're going to see the difference. Right. So again, I'm just adding different configurations right here. All right. So. I've added param locks, you know, changes to the one, the five, the nine, and the 13. If I play it again, it just sounds like that. Now notice that if I stop it, this is blinking, right? So why the F is blinking? So when you do a param lock on a trigger, you know, right here is playing a note, it's gonna blink. And it, this is telling you that you have some param locking. If you press and hold and you go through the different params, whatever is highlighted, it means that you changed it in some fashion. So when it's blinking and it's red, it's mean, it means that you're triggering a new sound and it also has param locking. Also, what you can do, you can add locks to places where you're not playing, you're, you don't have a trigger. So if I do function and maybe go to here, notice that it's yellow. Now the yellow means that you're adding a lock right here. You can add a lock and you can still, you know, maybe go to the filter and do something like that. And whenever the sound goes through here, it's going to be doing whatever lock that you created. But this is yellow. It will not play a note. So red blinking meets tri means trigger and param lock. But the yellow blinking means that you just added a param lock. Right? And you can do this all over the place, but in different places. And just change the configuration. Maybe on this one, I'm going to be adding a log right there. And this one, I'm just going to maybe going to go up on the, on the reverb and the delay. It's not playing a note, but we are processing the sound with the param lock. It's a really cool thing, right? It's okay, so I'm gonna remove everything. We have nothing. I'm gonna go to the number eight. Now, can do all of this while we do it live? Yes, we can. So enter grid mode. I'm gonna be entering different steps. And if we play it, we have something like that. Now we are not standing on live record, but I'm gonna be going to live record and it starts blinking. So we are live recording. So right here, whatever we do is going to be recorded into the different steps. So maybe I want to do something like that. And it's going to record whatever it is that you do. If I maybe go to delay. There you go. Just doing it live. You just record your sequence. Now, when I get out and go to, to uh, grid mode, notice that we get, have yellow all over the place. And it's because on each trigger, on each step, it's recording whatever motion or whatever values we added right here. Now, on some other, uh, you know, manufacturers or synths or devices, uh, this is called a different way. Uh, on the electron world, this is called locking, param locking. Um, the own core, for example, uh, this is called uh, motion sequence. Now, oh, you can also call it automation. It's some, you know, it's kind of a kind of automation that we do to each, you know, different params. But on the electron world, this is called locks, param locks. Okay, so we, we know that by removing the step, we can just, you know, erase whatever it is that you did. But maybe you don't want to. Maybe you just want to get rid of, I don't know, uh, maybe you want to get rid of some function. I'm going to go there. I'm going to see what I did. Maybe I want to get rid of the filter and the resonance. I, I can see that I did something right there. Now, what you can do, you can go to the control that, you know, controls that, that, that param. And by tapping it, you're just going to be removing it from the param lock and so on and so on and so on. So maybe I can go to this one and maybe on this one, let me just find the one where I did a lot of delay because I, there's one I did a lot of delay. Maybe there. There, I did a lot of delay. So I can just tap it and it's going to go back again to default. Same again to default. And if I play it, now we're not going to notice the difference because it's, we have a lot of pram locks. But uh, on this one, we just erased that one, you know, and we are not erasing everything. Now I'm going to be going to live record and we know that we have, uh, you know, param lockings. I'm going to be enabling live record. And while we do this, 
we can hold the no and go to whatever param that we want to delete and this will be resetting whatever we did for the frequency for the ray for the resonance and it's gonna go to whatever you know we did uh, right here on the reverb and whatever we did on the delay and i'm just pressing holding right and that is that it just kind of removes most of the params maybe i did something right there uh i have that one I'm gonna be removing it so i'm gonna just yellow but it's not blinking so we have no locking there okay so up to here this is the like the main power of the unit you know using the params the sequences the sound locking with the pool the param locking so this is like the main power of this now we still have a lot of functions to extend what we do but just knowing everything that we discussed so far you just can create amazing patterns and performances Okay, so let me just give you a few tips and shortcuts that you will need to uh, take note. All right, so when you're standing on a track and maybe you're standing on a property, maybe you want to move the tune and by default, it's going to go by tiny little amounts. If you press it and I'm pressing it, you know, press it and hold it, it's going to go much faster, right? The, the travel is way fast. And this is because you can use it on when you're performing. Maybe you want to detune it really fast. So you press it and it's just going to do it. If not, it's going to be, you know, you need to scroll, scroll, scroll in order to go up or go down. And this is pretty Pretty much with any of the data entry params so another thing that you can do is by going to the different params maybe let's say i go to the filter and i want to know the values for the envelope or in the frequency or resonance well if you press the param and hold it it's gonna let you see the values that you have for you know for each of the properties so if i make some changes right here something like that and something like that maybe i want to go back to the previously uh, you know known version of this param what the one i have stored in memory on the on the project so you hold the param and then you say no it says reload so you're going to be reloading whatever you have in memory now remember that this is the a reload to whatever state you had in memory so it's not really clearing by default it's not going to a default param but uh, if you want to do that holding the param and then going to play is going to do clear so this is going to do the reset of that page so i'm going to be adjusting the filter i'm going to do resonance attack i'm going to be messing with the decay the sustain and again i'm just preparing a an example so maybe i want to reset some some of the params i don't want to reset the whole thing so what uh, again you can do you just can go to maybe the attack i want to reset the attack i'm going to say no and it's going to reset the only the attack to the default uh, known last state maybe i want to do the filter i'm going to hold it pressing pressing hold you know pressing the button and then say no and it's just going to reset all the different params individually so another thing that you can do when this doesn't work for uh, all the properties i'm gonna try to stay to go to the tune i'm gonna go to sin and then go to the tune and try to go to zero and notice that it's just you know since it goes in very small amounts it's sometimes it's a little bit hard to go to a very specific point so what you can do you can hold the function and this is called uh you know jump it's gonna go to different values pre-assigned values like 12 octaves up you know 12 uh, you know semitones up one octave two octaves and for each of the properties you have different you know different positions and you know it's just a fast way to adjust the different properties if i go to the trigger for example holding this is going to go to different octaves by default now i'm gonna go maybe i don't know to track number eight and i'm gonna be changing it to a different sound maybe i want that one i'm gonna say yes so now this sound is gonna be that so maybe i don't want this i want to bring whatever i had from before you know when we saved the project so you can do it so you need to go to track right here hold the track then hold the trigger that belongs to you know the uh, you know sound and then say no and it's going to say track sound reloaded if i play it it's going to be the same sound that we had from before now if you save the project and you have a had a different sound it's going to bring that one I'm gonna go to the hats why not and I'm gonna just bring different hats right just like that so we have different hats and we know now that we can do some param locking so maybe you're gonna go to this one I'm gonna go to the synth and change the tune to something else maybe this one is gonna go low this one is gonna go high maybe on this one I'm gonna go to the amp and do delay and reverb something like that 
this one again maybe i'm gonna be going down in tune and we are just doing param blocking right okay so right now the only way we get to audition the different sounds every time that we go to a trigger is by doing play right but not really what you can do you can hold the trick this one you hold it and then you say yes it is gonna let you audition and see of course whatever it is that you're doing on that trigger maybe on this one it's a little bit obvious it's the delay and the reverb one so if i go there it's telling us that's what we uh changed so yeah you can do something like this right so let's talk about trick modifiers now the modifiers are cool now they are intended for live performances but you can record the triggers if you wanted to so the triggers are going to be the 13 14 15 and 16 and notice at the bottom it says retrick velocity then it says mod and then mod b i'm going to stand on retrick on this one and notice that uh, we are not on live recording you're not on anything and the 13 is selected so i'm going to be standing on uh maybe the hat so this means that when we play this and we are not recording it's going to be re-triggering the hat or the sound that we have selected if i go to a different sound maybe select this sound it's going to be re-triggering that and so on and on and on now on the 13 14 15 and 16 you have different rates if i go to 14th it's going to be faster then faster and then faster so this is what the retrick keys or you know this section is going to be doing now you can uh, you know perform live if i go maybe to a kick and do a four in the floor something like that and i stand on this one i can play it All right we can do something like this and if i go and do live recording right so we're going to be recording it right so you can record it if you wanted to so i'm going to be do function and for now i'm just going to do uh clear so if i play we have nothing and i want to again show you something else we know that we can record it or we can do it live on a performance now the thing is that what if i wanted to change some of the features some of the rates that we are using here by default so you do have a configuration page now we are standing on the 13 so we, it means that we are using the re trick now by doing function holding the function notice that right here it says modifier setup so this is the setup for the modifiers that we have at the bottom if i press the up arrow it's going to take us to the configuration page of the you know the modifiers so we are standing on the, th on the 13 so this means that this screen is for the retrick and right there is telling you dude the 13 is doing 1 8 then 1 16 is on the 14th the 15 is going to be 1 24s and then it's going to be 1 32s and again you can just play it while you're still on this screen now what you can do now is you can adjust the rates maybe this one is going to be super fast this one is going to be slow or whatever and this one is going to be you know different values you can just adjust your different values right here this one is way too slow So you can fine tune whatever it is that you do on the retricks. Now the thing is that you have all the things right here. It says velocity, then mod. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the velocity. I want to use the velocity. How can we go from this retrick to the velocity? You cannot use both the same at the same time. So I'm gonna be holding the function, and instead of going and standing on the retrick, I'm gonna stand on the velocity. And notice that the interface now changes because this is about velocity. So when I play it, this is what's gonna happen. Right? It's not re-triggering. So what it does by default is that the 13 is going to be lower in velocity. This one is going to be higher and we can see right there. This, this one is going to be higher and this one is going to be higher in velocity. And if I play it, what is that? This one is softer. This one is harder. Yeah, this is what we do. We have assigned different uh, assigned different velocities to each of the different keys. So if we exit here and maybe we want to record it we can do it right and we are just recording with different accents because it's higher in velocity and lower in velocity now remember that you can fine tune all of this maybe it's going to be this one is going to be really low in velocity then this one's something like that and this one's going to be really high so super slow low in velocity and then high 
All right, so this is, you know, how it works. You just uh, stand on something you selected and then you just configure if you want to configure it. Now, the thing is that then you have the mod A and you have the mod B. Now, this one's, and uh, you need to stand on the 15 or the 16. You have two slots to do this, and they are completely the same. If I stand on the 15, now what it do, what it does is that you need to select the destination. Right now, by default, it's going to be the synth decay, but I can do whatever I, wherever the if I want. If I go there, and maybe I'm going to be doing the synth tune. Why not? Uh, I'm going to be saying yes to that one. And now, when we use this, Notice this is just, you know, we have different values for the tuning, you know, for the uh, for the pitch of the engine. It is low in tune, higher, higher, and higher. So you can select whatever you want, maybe select the filter and, you know, the filter uh, cutoff for, you know, you have a lot of options right here. Maybe change the LFO while you're doing it. Maybe change the delay, you know, maybe I can go to the amp and change the delay scent. I'm gonna stand there, I'm gonna select yes, and now, more delay to more delay. Maybe I'm going to go to this one and make it really obvious. All right. So you always need to go here and just fine tune whatever it is that you want to do. And remember, you can record this or you can just use it uh, as a live performance tool. And you get two modifiers, the A, and then if you go to function and the B is going to be, you know, completely the same as the A, but you can just change the source. Now I'm going to go back to the retrick and no, nope, that is that we get it. So if I go out, uh, we when we are standing on a track, in this case the hat, when we play the keys, it's just gonna be re-triggering. Now when we go to the uh, setup right here, we have something that says trick. So if you go to this one, it's going to turn off the trick or turn it back on. So what is the difference? So by, by default, it's on. You press the key, and it's just gonna re-trigger it. If I turn it off, notice that it doesn't do anything. So what you need to do, you need to press the retrig and hold it, and then when you play whatever sound, it's just gonna do it. But you need to hold the retrig in order for this to happen. So if I turn this on, whenever I play this, it's gonna start retriggering. That's the main difference. So if I turn it off, it's just not gonna do it. I need to tap this one in order for the retrig and you know whatever modifier you have right here to happen. Okay, so let's talk about one of the things that make uh, the syntax its own thing. Now it might be a little bit confusing at first, but uh, we're gonna divide it in parts and you're gonna understand that it's very simple. Okay, so uh, you have two main parts. You have an analog effects block and an effects track. Now, they are related, but they are, uh, in fact, different things. Now, for example, if I go to a sound, whatever sound, it doesn't matter. I'm using a, you know, fresh project, so we have the default kit. So, and on a sound, we have a trigger. So, when we add it to a sequence, that's going to be uh, a trigger, right? So, we have that on a track. So, uh, each track has its own trick, has its own synth, which is going to be the thing that makes the sound, the filter, the amp, and the LFO. And we, again, we, we know this, each track has its own params. So, when you make a sound and you add a trick, this is going to be triggering whatever machine that you have, and then that sound is going to go through the filter, then the amp, the LFO, so on, and then goes out to the main, you know, the main mixer, and that's how you know you hear the sound. So, again, this is how it works, it's like its own channel. You have the kick, or this channel, that goes through a chain of events, and then it goes out. So, the effects block is something like that. Something will go through this block, might be the kick, the snare, or different sounds, or all the, all the sounds go through this chain calls, that calls the effects block. Something is gonna, be, get, is gonna get processed in somehow by all the params that we have right here, and then the sound is gonna come out. If I go to the effects block, notice it's orange and everything turns orange, and it's because we are standing on the effects block. So what we can do, we can select different sounds and have them go through the effects block. Now the effects block is going to process the sound, sound, uh, sound somehow, and then the sound is going to go out to the main mixer. This is how it sounds. Now the effects block, just like any of the other tracks, 
has its own properties. It has a trigger, it has a, a sin. In this case, we don't have, uh, you know, machines because the effects block doesn't produce any sounds, but we have an analog drive that we have right here, right? So then we have a filter section, and then we have an amp section and an LFO section. So whatever sound that goes through the effects block is going to be processed in some fashion and then go out to the main mix. All right, so I'm going to go out of the effects block and I'm going to be standing maybe on a kick. Maybe I'm going to use the number nine. I'm going to add something. I'm going to create a simple pattern so we can have something to work with. And I'm going to go to the snare right here. I'm going to select the snare and I'm going to be adding the snare, right? So again, just something simple. I'm going to get out. I'm going to select the hi-hat and I'm going to be adding the hats right there. Maybe I'm going to be doing... Ah. I'm going to do something like that. Or maybe yes, because we're going to use it in a little while. So, okay, so we have a simple pattern, right? So what we want to do is we want to select the tracks, the different tracks. We have 9, 10, and 4 that will go through the effects block. And you have a couple ways of doing this. What you can do, you can go to function, and while you're holding function, you can tap the effects, and it's going to take you to the routing. So here you decide which track will go through the effects block. Remember, we have the 9, the 10, and the 4. So if I select it, the 9, the kick is going to go through the effects block. The snare is going to go through the effects block. And the 4th, which is fourth, which is hi-hat, is going to go through the effects block. Now, if I play it, it's completely the same, right? But the, the, these tracks, they are going through the analog effects block. So what we can do now, we can make changes right here. Maybe I can go right here to effects and I can go to the sin and I can add a little bit of drive. Right? So we are adding drive to just the kick, just the snare, just the hi-hat. Maybe we want to filter. So if I want to filter, it's going to be filtering the whole damn thing. And it's just doing the kick, snare and hat and not the other tracks if we don't add them to the block. That's, you know, how this works. You also have an amp right here, right? So you can just, you know, change how the amp works or maybe add a little bit of reverb just to those sounds. Now, the thing is that you don't need to add everything to the block if you don't want to. Maybe the kick and the snare, you just don't want to process it like the whatever, you know, we are doing right now in the effects block. So you just remove them out of the equation. And the kick and the snare gets, uh, you know, they stay unprocessed by the effects block, but the hi-hat is getting processed, right? So this is how the effects block works. Now also, and for now, I'm just going to be going to amp and remove the uh, delay and the reverb. And if I play it, we just have pretty much the same thing. If I go back to the effects block, notice that right there at the bottom, we have other options. And this are the buttons that will enable the, that. So this one is the delay. Maybe you want to grab the delay and process it through the effects block. This one is going to be the reverb, right? Just the reverb. Maybe you want to grab the reverb and process through the effects block. Super simple. And this one is the in. So right there at the top, right here, you don't see it. Maybe the camera is not showing it. Uh, you have an input for left and right. Maybe whatever it is that you're inputting right there at the back, you want to make it go through the analog effects block. So you can just, you know, enable it from here. Now I'm gonna remove this. If I go maybe to the uh, amp and I make it go through everything to a delay and reverb, it's gonna sound like that. that that's fine. This is not what I want to show you. So we know that it, uh, the kick, the snare, and the hat, they are going through the effects block, but I'm adding it from here. Now, what I can do, I can remove it from here. You don't need to go to this section by doing funk in the effects, but what you can do, you can go to whatever sound, maybe the kick or the snare, and if you go, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to go to the kick, the, the, the kick track, and I go to the amp. Now, if you go to the second page of the amp, it says route right there. So uh, right here, you can just, you know, add it to the effects block from here. So right now it's going to be post. So if it's, uh, you know, post, it's me it means that it's not going through the effects block. But pre right here, there, it means that it's going through the effects block. So if I go to the snare and I make it pre, the hat, and I make it pre, if I go back to the effects block, we can see that we just we are just adding them to the block right there. Uh, but the only difference is that you just don't do it from here, you just do it from the amp of each, you know, each section. And if I play it, 
everything is getting processed by the effects block, right? So it's just, just another way of adding the sounds to the effects block. All right, so I'm going to go back to the effects and I'm going to be removing, uh, you know, that uh, uh, reverb and that, uh, you know, delay. And I have something simple. Now, everything is going to the effects block, the kick, the snare and the hat. So the other part, so this is the effects block. Now, the other part of the equation is the effects track. So just like the other tracks like this ones, when we enable them, we have a sequence. We can create a sequence, we can trigger the sound and, you know, do param locking and everything else. Well, the effects track, when you go to the effects, is going to be pretty much the same thing. It has its own sequencer. Now, I'm going to be getting out there. So when the effects is on and this is yellow, whatever you do right here is going to affect uh, the effects track or the effects uh, block. And again, this works like, uh, you know, when we add tricks and we modify the params, we do param locking. The only difference is that it will be affecting the params on the effects block. Now, let me just give you an example. I know that the kick, the snare and the, and the, and the hat are going through the effects block. Now, I'm going to get out of here and we are still standing on the effects block. So I'm going to enter grid recording and I can just add the triggers for the effects block. I'm going to go to the 13. As soon as I do so, and I'm going to be playing this, you're going to notice that something is going to happen after the 13. If I play it... Can you notice the difference? So the sound, when it starts, it's... I wouldn't say loud, it's just, you know, normal. And then when it reaches the 13, the volume is just going, it's just going down, right? It's just uh, reaching the 13 and the volume goes down and never goes up. It goes up very slowly, but then when we reach the 13 again, it's going down in volume again. And this is because on the effects block, the amp, by default, this is the envelope. It's a duck. It's not, uh, you know, going up in volume. It's going down in volume. And you right there, you have a hold. So it's really, really long. And that's why when we reach the 13, it's triggering the envelope of the envelope, uh, of the amp. And there's all this is happening on the effects block. Now, the effects block has, has its own trigger. So every time that it finds a trigger on the sequence for the effects block, it's going to be triggering the LFO, triggering the filter, and triggering the amp. And if you think about this, if I go out of the effects block, this is just like any of the other tracks. We have a, have a trigger, and every time that it finds a trigger, it's going to be triggering the LFO and the filter, but it's, it's going to be for this track, right? The params of whatever track we are using. Now, if we go to the effects, this one is triggering the LFO, the filter, and the amp. So when we reach the 13, the amp is reacting because we are triggering the amp when we find the trick number 13. Now, if I do the same, when I go to the amp, but I make the amp a lot shorter, something like that, you're gonna notice that the volume goes down and then goes up really quickly. Right? So this is what we do. We add a trigger and the trigger will do something to the filter, to the amp or to the LFO if we are triggering them. Okay, so let me just give you a different example. I'm going to remove the, you know, the trigger on the effects block and I'm going to go out of the effects block. I have a... I'm going to go to the 6. I'm going to be adding a sound on the 1 and the 9. And I'm going to be going to the trigger and make it really long, right? So it's really long and it's uh, kind of in the way. So one of the most common examples is creating a kick sidechain, right? We want to duck whatever sound when we are playing the kick, right? Okay, so I'm going to be playing this. Now, if I go to the effects block, I need to add the number six to the effects block. Now, since we want to duck the volume every time that the kick and the snare hits, we don't want the kick and the snare on the effects block. So I'm gonna remove them and we just have the hats and that, you know, synth sound. So now what we need to do, we need to get out of here, but stay on the effects block and the duck, the ducking is gonna happen every time that the kick hits. So it's gonna be the one, the five, the nine and the 13. And notice that every time that the kick hits, the volume is just going down. Now we can make it a lot more obvious. If I go to a mute mode and I mute the kick and the snare, 
we can hear we can hear it stucky. Right, so again, that just that's how it works. I'm gonna get out of here and I'm gonna make it maybe a little bit more obvious. There you go. You can even go down level. Right, so maybe around there it's gonna be a little bit more obvious. If I play it, it's going down, it's ducking whenever the kick hits. And if I remove them, we can notice the difference. Right? Now it's still, you know, we can go to the effects and just make it less obvious. I'm just making it super obvious. There we go. And if I bring the kick and the snare, now we are doing that, you know, side chain. Oh, sorry, not here. I'm gonna go to the mutes and just gonna unmute them. There you go. So that's it, you know, you go to the effects track, you add the tricks, and when, whenever you you want to trigger something on the LFO, something on the filter, or something on the amp, it's just gonna go and do it. Now still, if you go to the amp, you have different modes right here. You, you can use still use an ADSR, or, you know, have an HAA uh, attack, hold, and decay, or, you know, in this case, uh, by default, is gonna be this one, which is, you know, what we use for ducking. So this works, if I get out of the effects track, works just like, you know, the other sounds and the sequencer that we have right here. It's just pretty much the same. The only difference is that, you know, it just works on the effects block. Now, uh, if I go back to the effects block and go there, we are doing the ducking, but maybe, I just want to do something else. Can we do param locking like we can, you know, we would or we can on the other standard tracks? Yeah, we can. Maybe I'm gonna stand right here and when I go there, maybe I want to add a little bit of drive on that one and it's gonna do it on this one. And notice that it's blinking. So if it's blinking, we are doing param locking on that one. So on the step number one, it's going up in drive. If I go there, it's gonna show it. So we can do whatever the F we want. We can add, instead of a trigger, because remember the trigger triggers the LFO filter and amp, maybe we don't want to do this, maybe I can go to the number two and add param tricks, uh, yeah, param locks. So I'm gonna be holding this one and I'm gonna be doing something, you know, wild, something like that, so we can really notice the difference. That is that it's doing it. Maybe I'm gonna go to this one, go to the amp and make it something like that. And maybe this one is gonna be reverb. And just like this, we know we are, we are affecting the whole sequence. And I'm going really aggressive so you can, you know, see how it works. Right? So that's it, you know, you uh, add things to the effects block and whatever is that you're adding, you can just process it. And if you want, you use the sequencer to trigger changes on the different params. Okay, so let's talk about saving and the temporary saved. Now, we never talked about saving. I'm going to be showing you right now. It's just pretty simple. Let's say that you have something, some pattern right here. Maybe I'm going to go track and this is just like, you know, assume like this is the track we, we want to save. Now I'm working on, I'm standing on a fresh, you know, new project, never saved it. So how can we save it? Now I'm gonna go to Funk and notice that at the bottom it says Save Project. If this is a project that you uh, you know initialized as new and never saved it, you uh, it's gonna take you to the menu and ask you where do you want to save it. So maybe I'm gonna be saving it there. I'm gonna say yes, and then you need you just you need just uh, you know you need to change the name. And you know what? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna call it cool. And once you're done, there you go. So your project is saved. Now, every time that you are working on this device, make sure when you make changes to save your project. When you are standing on a pattern, I'm standing on the bank A and the pattern number one of the uh, bank A, notice it says untitled. How can we, you know, save the pattern, but also change the name? So right here, it says save pattern and reload pattern. This is not it. This is going to be the temporary save that we're going to be uh, talking, you know, we're going we're gonna to talk about in a minute. Now, what we need to do, if we do function and we do save project, is going to be saving the patterns that we have, you know, inside the project. So that's one way of saving the project. 
uh, saving the patterns, right? So you can do that, save the project. Now, if still, if you go to settings right there, you have a pattern option. If you go to pattern, it's going to give you a bunch of options like clear the pattern, save to project, reload from the project. If you have a different version of the pattern, you can reload it from here. But maybe you want to rename it and I'm going to be calling it, I don't know, intro or something like that. I don't know. I'm going to call it tiger just to call it something. I don't know. So I'm going to do uh, yes. And you're changing, you know, the pattern name. Pretty simple. Always remember to save the project. If not, you know, you're going to lose it. Okay, so we are swimming on a pattern that has a kick and a snare. We know this is the tiger pattern. So you have the uh, temporary save and this is the save pattern and the reload pattern. So when you do funk and yes, it's going to temporary save the changes that you made right here. If you do funk and then no, it's going to reload whatever properties, whatever was on the pattern that you had in the project before saving it. So I'm going to be standing on the snare. I'm going to be maybe do, I don't know, something right there. And what I want to do, I want to maybe make some changes. I'm going to maybe go to, I don't know, the amp and I'm going to be doing whatever. It doesn't matter. Maybe a delay. What? And a reverb. Something like that. So maybe I don't want this. So if you want to reload whatever you had saved from before, funk and no, and it's gonna reload whatever you had from before. Right? So pretty simple. Now, why do you get a temporary save? Because you can save the pattern temporary. So, okay. So let's say I uh, go right here and I do something like that, right? And I play it. And I, let's say that this is the cool sound. Right, so if I want to commit to memory this, I can do funk and I can do save. And it says pattern saved temp area. So this is temporary saved. It's not really saved to, you know, the, uh, the project. So then, since I saved it on the temporary memory, I'm going to be doing some play. And maybe I'm going to decide that I'm going to be panning it to the left. Right? And I never, you know, saved this change, you know, the panning. So maybe I decide at some point that I don't like it. And I just wish to go back. But, you know, going back to each of the parents, maybe you change the filter, the sin, the machine and everything else. Maybe going back uh, param by param is a problem. Since you have a temporary save, you can, you can reload back to that version. So this is why you get the temporary save. You can reload it back to the default if you never saved it temporary. And uh, if you make a lot of changes and you wish to go back, then you do no and you go back to the previous version. And if you make some changes and you really like it, you commit it to the temporary memory. And if you make more changes and you want to go back, you say no and it's going to go to the previous version. And it's always like that. You make changes. And if you like them, you just save them in the temporary. If you don't like them, you just go no and you go back to the previous version. Now, all of this is super cool because you can just explore with sounds. And if you don't like it, you can always do funk no and go back to the previous one and do something else. And you're never saving or storing the changes as, uh, you know, on the pattern. Right now, we, are, we never save the project. We never save the pattern. So if we want to save it, you need to save them. If we go out and more, we turn off the device and we turn it on, whatever we stored on the temporary memory is going to be lost. So if you want to commit the changes, you need to save the project. Okay, so now it's time to talk about chains. Now I'm working on a project that calls, uh, you know, calls chains and I'm standing right there in that project. And it's because I just prepared something very simple and very dumb. I have three different patterns. If I go to the first one and play it, that's going to be the first. If I go to the two, that's going to be the two. Snare and a kick. And the other one is going to be snare and a kick and a hat. Right? Pretty simple. So we have just three different patterns. Now you can chain up to 64 different patterns on, on this, you know, on this device. So to create a chain, it's actually pretty simple. You need to hold the pattern right here, and then you need to hold at the same time you're holding pattern, the pattern that will start the chain. So I'm going to say that I'm going to start it on the number two. So 
I'm going to be pressing that one and I'm holding to, you know, the pattern and the pattern number. And then when I do the three, maybe is going to be playing and right there is going to tell you the chain. First is going to be playing the one, then it's going to be playing the three. Then I'm going to go to the pattern number two and it's going to play the number two. Maybe I'm going to be doing two rounds of the number two, then the number three, and then it's going to go back to the beginning. And that's how you make a chain. So if I make a play, first it's going to play the first one. It's going to go to the three. Then it's going to go to the two, another round of the two, and then it goes to the three and the whole thing starts over. So this is how you create chains. You pattern hold, you, sell, you hold whatever pattern is going to be your first one, and then you just chain the other patterns. Super simple. Now this is good, but the bad part is that you lose the chain if you create a new chain or you lose it when you change patterns or banks or you don't save the project because you cannot store it in a project. So, you know, the change, the chains is something that you create for the moment. Now, luckily, you have the song mode. Okay, so I have a project right here and I have something I made with the, uh, you know, very simple with the uh, default kit. If I'm standing on the pattern number one, I have one, two, three and four different patterns. If I play it, this is going to be the pattern number one and it's called intro. If I go to the two, it's going to be intro two, which is the bass and the kick. Right? If I go to the three, it's going to be the verse. And then I'm going to go to the number four and it's going to be like a break. Right? So we have four different parts. Now what we want to do, what I want to do is I want to create a song out of this. So to enter to the song mode and create a song, this is the button, this is the magic button. When you tap it, it's going to ask you, dude, do you want to make a song? The song mode, it's off right now. Do you want to turn it on? And yes, and notice that it's, you know, yellow. Yes, it means that you turn the song mode on. So I'm going to be saying that, yes, I want the song mode on. And at the top, it's going to say song one is empty. So, okay, I'm going to go back to the song mode and you have different options. You can edit your song or you can load a song or you can go to the menu. I'm going to go to the menu. Now, when I go to the menu, you will get a bunch of options for the song. You can rename a song, you can clear a song or you can load a song. Now, the thing is that on uh, per project, you can store up to 16 different songs. So maybe you can create 16 different variations of the same patterns. Or maybe if you have a lot of, you know, uh, different performances within the same project, you can store up to 16 songs, which is crazy. You know, it's just, just fantastic. So what I want to do, I want to create a song and work with the four different patterns I have. So I'm going to be standing on a song and I'm going to be loading the number one, right? We were already standing on the number one, but still, I'm going to go to rename it. And I'm going to be renaming this to, I don't know, ice. I'm going to call it the ice, whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm going to say yes. And then it's going to be rename it. And we're going to be working with the ice song. And whenever you save the project, you know, save to project, this song is going to be saved within the project. So you can always go back here. The question is, how can you, and I'm going to say no again, how can you uh, create the song? So back to the song and I'm going to go to edit and notice that it says we are working with the ice song and then it's going to ask you, it's going to, you know, give you a bunch of options. So this is where you create the song and then when you uh, save it, it's just going to be saving it to the project. Now this how it works is that you add rows and each row has the information of what needs to play. So each row will play a pattern that you get, you know, uh, that you select a certain amount of times. And now you need to be careful with this. Now you need to add rows. The way you add rows is by doing function and down and it says right there. Now if you do function and up, it's going to delete the row. Row. And if you created a row and you delete it, you cannot get back. So you need to make sure that you do down to add a new row. So we can see that the first row is the zero one and we are doing a bunch of things. We're going to talk about this. Now you have a different categories right here. Now the first one is going to be the label, which is the name of, you know, the part that you want to play uh, on that specific part. 
the, the pattern that you're going to be working with, then you have the row repeat how many times you're going to be uh, repeating that pattern or that row. Then you have the length of the row, then the tempo. And uh, finally, it's the row mute. Now, all of these ones or these options are pretty simple to understand. The only ones that they require a little bit of explanation is going to be the row length and the row mute. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to explain in a minute. So first, I want to create a, a song, right? I want to create a chain. So at the end, right here at the bottom, you can navigate with the arrows. At the end, it's going to ask you, do what happens when the song ends? Is going to loop back to the beginning? Well, with the uh, with the level data, you can say, no, I don't want to uh, loop it. I want to stop. So it's going to play all your, you know, all your rows. And when it's done, it's going to stop the playback. So in this case, I'm going to use stop. So what do we need to, to do now? Well, we have a we have a we have different patterns and we have songs, so we need to select the parts. Now the first one is going to be which name you're going to, you want to be use you want to be using is an intro, is an outro, is a chorus, what it is. So you can use pattern name or you can maybe use intro and it's just going to be using that one. So what do we want to play? Well, I want to use my pattern number one, which is the intro. And how many times do you want to play it? Well, I'm going to play it one time. Then you can, you know, uh, play it uh, for uh, multiple times with the with this one. We're going to talk about this one in a minute. But by default, when you add a pattern, it's going to recognize the length of the pattern. That's why it says 16. If my intro, this pattern, the A1, was uh, 64 steps long, this would be saying 64. It's just going to recognize it by default. And then you have the tempo. You can alter the tempo. Uh, of each row, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do it in a couple minutes. So first, we're gonna, you know, kind of a ensemble our, you know, uh, song. So I want to add a new row. I'm gonna be doing function, and I'm gonna be doing down, and it's gonna add a new row. Now next, next is gonna be the intro too. So I'm gonna be selecting the pattern name in this case. I'm gonna stand right there in the pattern, pattern name, and I'm gonna be going to this one. Now this one is not the A1. It's gonna be the A2. So as soon as I move out. Is gonna you know say intro maybe i made a mistake right there let me just select the pattern name well you know it's just not giving me the name but you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna still call it intro so uh it's gonna be the a2 right just the pattern number two how many times i want to play it one time same tempo same amount of steps what's next i want to bring the verse so okay i'm gonna go right there and i'm gonna bring the verse i need to select the i need to select the name, which is going to be verse, I'm going to, you know, let it pass, is going to be which one? The A2? No, it's going to be the three. That's the verse. It's going to be uh, how many times are we going to be looping this? So this depends up to you. It's, it, you can play it one time. I'm going to be playing it twice. Still on 16, same tempo, right? So super easy. I'm going to do function and I'm going to be adding one more row. This one is going to be the verse. Well, actually, I'm going to call it uh, the pattern name gonna say yes and this one is gonna be the four now if you remember the number four was the break and it makes sense that you know we make it for maybe two two uh you know two rounds of this and i'm gonna be adding one more and we you're gonna see why in a minute i'm gonna be going to here and just gonna change it back to maybe outro right and then it's gonna be the verse and i'm gonna show you an example right here and it's going to be playing it maybe just i don't know i'm going to say twice why not so okay so that's the plan we're going to be changing this in a minute so it's going to be able to play the intro then the intro two then the verse it's going to play twice and then it's going to be playing a break and then it's going to be playing the verse as an outro now as soon as we do this that's that's the song. If we stop and you know we play it, it's gonna show you right there what's going on. First, then it goes to the break twice, and then goes back to the outro. And when it's done, the song stops. Okay, so what the f is the row length? So it's gonna be this uh, you know this column. So maybe I'm gonna go to the break, right? So what you can do right here, you can offset the amount of steps that uh, it's gonna be playing that row, right? So it, right now it's 16, which is the default length of the break. But maybe I'm just gonna you know I'm just gonna go down and I'm gonna be making it, make it, making it I don't know seven or six or maybe I'm gonna do it four. And I'm gonna go up maybe four times 
in the break. So instead of playing 16 steps of that pattern, he's going to play the first four and then just loop it and loop it and loop it four times because we have four right here. And maybe what I want to do, I want to go down in tempo. Maybe I don't want to play it at, at 120. I want to play it, I don't know, I want to play it faster. So I'm going to go maybe to 150, something like that. I'm just doing random things. So if I play it, it's going to play the intro, intro two, then the verse, twice, and then... Right? So just by doing this, um, instead of just using whatever it is that you do did for your break, you can introduce a variation to maybe that break because you use it twice or something like that. So you can adjust the tempo and adjust the uh, the pattern length. Now the next thing, the the, the one thing that you know we didn't uh, discuss is going to be the what the f is this? So this is the mute. So when you go right here and if I um, stand right here and I say yes, it's gonna ask you which. Uh, parts, you know, you want to mute. So you can mute the effects, you can mute uh, the 12 different tracks only when that row plays. I'm gonna get out of here and just show you something else first. Now, when you play the song right here, I'm gonna be uh, playing what well, it's gonna be stopping, then I'm gonna be playing it. And what I want to do, I want to stay at the outro and loop it because I want to edit. So when you're standing on the outro, so for that, I'm gonna be doing this and this. So what I did, I did this, and notice that the left arrow is going to be loop. So when you do this, it's going to loop whatever row that you are, uh, you know, you're standing. And if you say uh, stop looping, it's going to continue the song. And I'm going to do it again, I'm going to be playing it, and as soon as we reach to the outro, I'm going to be going here and just loop it. Almost there. There. And I'm going to loop it. So now, the main point of doing this is that you can adjust whatever it is that you, it's happening on the outro. And what I want to do, I'm going to go to the mutes. And instead of ending the song with a verse, I'm going to be ending the song with, I don't know, something else. It doesn't matter. And right now, I'm just muting the different parts. So maybe I just want to end it like that. Let's say that this is how we want to end it. Once we are done, we say yes. And it's telling you right here on this row, you know, you have some mutes with that icon. And when you're done, you know, editing, you just keep looping and it's going to continue the song. And that's it. That's the whole track. And once you are done, you can go to the song menu and you can save it because, you know, you need to save it. I'm going to be going to menu and I'm going to go and save to project just to make sure it's completely saved. Yes, song saved. And if you wanted to, uh, when you save the project, you can, you know, save, it's going to be saving the song. At the top, if you exit out of the song mode, it will give you the playback, you know, it's going it's to give you the chain, the, the rows that you're playing. So I'm going to be playing it. And there you go, it's just telling you how, what's going on in your song. And the song ends. I know it's a pretty dull example, you know, with this drag, but this is how you create a song. You just go to your edit, your song mode, you edit all the different rows, and then you save the song. Okay, so we are pretty much done. I'm gonna be covering the last things that, you know, we need to discuss that we didn't discuss, like the delay, the reverb, and the mixer that we have right here. So by doing function and going to the filter, it's gonna take you to the delay options. So you can, and this is just very simple. You can adjust the time, and again, it's global. You can, uh, right here, you can uh, use it as a normal delay, or you just can make it a ping pong delay. Now the width is going to make it wider, if you're using ping pong, it's going to be really noticeable, but it's just like, a, you know, it's just a stereo width. It just can make it, uh, you know, wider. Now, the feedback works just like any of the feedback. Let me just maybe go to an, a sound. I'm going to go to that one and I'm going to be adding uh, some, some delay. So function, back to the delay. Now, the feedback, again, it's just a feedback going way too up. It's going to do that. But maybe I go up on the width. You're gonna really notice it on the ping pong, All right? So pretty standard controls that you get on pretty, uh, you know, any delay. 
Now you do have a filter if you want to low pass the, uh, you know, uh, to cut the low frequencies. You can, that's the high pass. And if you want to low pass, which is going to be you're cutting, uh, you know, the higher frequencies before you go to the delay, you can do it. Pretty simple. Now then what you can do, you have this one. Now this one will be sending the delayed signal back to the reverb. It's going to send it to the reverb. And this is just, you know, going to affect the sound because now the delay is going through the reverb. It's sending, you know, a part of the delay sound to the reverb. And then you can adjust the volume if you want to. Fine. So pretty, again, standard controls. Now I'm going to be maybe going again to the amp of that synth sound and I'm going to be going down the attack. And I'm going to go up maybe on the, on the, on the reverb. So if I go to function and I go to amp, it's going to enter the reverb uh, settings, the reverb panel, and you have a pre-delay uh, for the reverb. You have a decay, so if you want to make it really long, you can. Now this one is going to be the, the is a shelving EQ. So by default, this if you go all the way down, we are cutting the higher frequencies of the, of the, uh, of the reverb. If I go up, uh, we are not doing anything. We are just letting the higher frequencies pass. All right. So with this one, you select the frequency in which you cut that section, or maybe you can go and just make nothing, you know, do nothing. But maybe you just don't want to chop it all. Maybe you just want a little bit of the highs, you know, the super highs, and then it's just, you know, going to do it for you. Now, all of this depends on your sounds, because sometimes when you go through a, a reverb, you send a lot of things to a reverb, if this is all the way up, uh, it's going to get, you know, really <laughs> uh, muddy. I wouldn't say muddy, but it's going to get a lot more dense. So you can just, you know, duck. That's why it's a shelving EQ. You can just duck that part of the reverb. Now, still, you have uh, these controls, so you can control what goes into the reverb. If you want to cut the low frequencies, it's going to, for now, just going to maybe go all the way up and gain. Maybe I want to cut the low frequencies that go to the reverb. And now the reverb is just going to take the super high frequencies. Maybe I want to cut the higher frequencies before going to the reverb. It's just going to affect, you know, how the reverb sounds because we are cutting part of the, of the uh, spectrum before we go, you know, part of the frequencies before we go to the reverb. And then you have the volume. Now you have an internal and an external mixer. So right there, it says mixer. When you go to function and you access the mixer, it's going to, you know, let you know all the tracks, how much volume you're doing. And this is another gain stage that you have. If you uh, do function and you keep tapping, you have the all the way, uh, you know, from the uh, track one to uh, till the track 12. And then you have the effects, the reverb and delay. So if you have something, you can manage your volumes. It's, it's like, you know, the mixer. So the kick is on the on number nine, or maybe you're going to use the number six. So the number six is going to be this one. It can go down the volume. You just can adjust your, you know, uh, adjust your faders. Maybe less reverb, less delay. You know, it depends on what you want to do. If you're using the effects track, you can control it from here. Right? So again, just pretty simple, pretty standard. Now, if you go to the third page of the mixer, you have the external in. Now, remember that you can connect something at the back right here, you know, right there, right? You have it, you know, right there. The camera maybe is not showing it. You can connect something at the back and it's going to go through this device. So this is how you control how much, how volume, uh, you know, that goes in from the external device. If you want to send it to a delay and if you want to send it to a reverb, you can also offset the volumes of whatever is going into this device. And if you want to send it to the effects uh, block, so pre remember it it's sending to the effects block and post, it means not sending it to the effects block. Okay, so we are pretty much done. The only thing I'm going to be covering right now is a little bit more in depth about the filter and the LFO because, you know, we, we didn't talk in depth about this ones. And I'm going to be, you know, doing this. If you don't want to, I'm not going to be explaining, you know, I want to keep watching. I'm not going to explain anything else. You just can, you know, move on. Uh, so, okay, so I'm going to be maybe using this sound. Then this one, because is you know, we have a tone and I'm going to make it, you know, something around there uh, and I'm going to be doing something like that. All right. Pretty simple. 
So if we go to the filter, we have, you know, the, uh, the ADSR, we already talked about this. And we can just, you know, chop frequencies and add resonance. Then when you go to the envelope, we decide how much of the envelope that we have right here is going to be modulating the cutoff. Pretty simple. Now remember that you have a low pass. Let me go to a high pass. And instead of chopping high uh, frequencies, we're going to be chopping low frequencies. And notice that the modulation still reacts to this. Now I can go negative on this one if you wanted to. So all of this, we could have already talked about this. So what we didn't discuss a lot is going to be the EQ. So on this one, we you can boost and still, you know, it's going to be modulating whatever it is that you do. Your just can cut as well. Now you have different EQs because they have, uh, you know, they're going to be a little bit narrow, more narrow or wide. It depends on, you know, what you want to do. Maybe if I go up on this one, let me go to that and I'm going to be going up in resonance. Notice that something weird happens. It's not re-triggering. So we need to do the re-trigger. Now it's a little bit more obvious. All right. Now the thing that we didn't discuss with the filter, but now all of this we kind of uh, talked about this. Now what we didn't discuss is the delay. So let's say I'm gonna be doing, maybe not the EQ, I'm gonna be doing a little bit of low pass. And if I play it, it's gonna be, again, pretty obvious. So if I go to the filter, to the second page, the delay is going to introduce a little bit of delay to the envelope. So this control is right here, but this control should be right there. Now, the thing is that, you know, we don't have enough controls <laughs> to add it uh, here. So they, uh, you know, add it there. So this is what we'll do. It will add a little bit of delay. So if I uh, go out and I play the sound, notice that it takes a little bit of time before it fires. All right, I'm going to press it. Nothing happens and it goes off. Now, if I go back to the envelope, notice that right there we have, uh, you know, we have a space. So this is going to be the delay. So we are delaying the execution of the uh, of the envelope. All right. For now, I'm just going to go all the way down to no delay. So as soon as we play it, you know, we can hear it. I'm going to be playing the sequence. And then you get the bass and you get the width. Now, this is going to be a low pass and high pass uh, in a chain. So if I cut the low frequencies, we are going to be cutting the lows, we get with highs. Now if I go to the width, we are doing just the opposite. That is, we get more of the lows. If we do nothing, we get nothing. Now you do get this because maybe you want to maybe stand on maybe a peak filter. You know, something like that, a bell or something like that. And you, you know, you want to use this like this, but maybe you want to adjust and cut a little bit of the lows because it's just way too low. And maybe you want to cut a little bit of the highs. So you can use the filters, this second part of the filter to adjust without, you know, without uh, having to use that one. That's the main purpose. So that's it, that's the filter. Now there's one more thing that you need to know that when you go to maybe, not the sound, I'm gonna go to this one. The analogs are gonna be a little bit different. They have different filters. So for now, I'm just gonna do something like that. And I'm gonna go there and we have a, a band pass. And remember that the resonance is the one that will affect the band pass. All right, if I go all the way down, get that. So since we have a band pass, we have the other side, which is going to be a notch. And again, the resonance will affect the notch. If I go all the way up, it's super, you know, short. And if I go uh, to the other side, it's going to be wider. Now, it's a shame that we don't get these filters on the, on the uh, digital ones, because, you know, that would be cool. So the next one is a different type of filter. That is that it's not chopping the high frequencies. We can't do a resonance, but it has a tiny little peak right there. But it's not completely chopping the high frequencies. 
right? So the next one is going to be a peak, just like we get on the other ones. And if I keep moving, made a mistake on this one. If I keep moving, we have the same thing we had with the low pass, but now it's going to be for the high pass, right? And then we have it, you know, we have off. If I go to the second page, notice that we don't have on the analogs the base and the width. We only get the delay and the vendor. Okay, so now I'm going to be going to the LFO. It's, again, the LFO is just, again, pretty straightforward. But if you're starting, some of the things are going to be a little bit confusing. So, okay, so let's start easy. I'm going to still use that, you know, that uh, synth sound, let's say. So you have your speed, which is going to be how fast the LFO goes. And then you can scale it. But first, before you, you know you do anything, you need to select the destination. What do you want to modulate? In this case, I'm going to go to the filter and I'm going to be chopping some frequencies, but I'm not going to use the envelope. So if I, as soon as I do so, it's just pretty dark, right? Because we are just not modulating. Maybe I'm going to go like that. So maybe I can uh, select the destination like the filter frequency and modulate it with an LFO. That's the plan. I'm going to be selecting the frequencies and I'm going to do yes. As soon as we do so, we are going to be using this settings to modulate what? Now, you need to select the depth. How much do you want to modulate or how much of the, you want to use of this LFO to affect the filter frequency? Now, notice it's super slow. So even if you go all the way up, it's, you know, still slow. And that's why you have the scale. But right now, it's, I guess, on two. Uh, if I go to four, it's going to scale the speed. If I go to eight, it's going to scale it up and up and up and up and up. Now you get this control because it's really simple to modulate this and get different types of modulations. Right? Even if you're all the way down and going re something really slow like this, at some point, maybe you just want to... You want to param lock this. This, this, is, this is why why you get this option. Now the other thing that you get is going to be the fade in and the fade out. So for this one, I'm going to be playing this. So notice that as soon as I play it, it starts. You know, it starts modulating. Now if I uh, fade it, what is that? Uh, it's, it starts, but I'm going to do something like that. I'm going to be playing it. But it starts, you know, with the modulation and then it's kind of off. So you're fading it out. Now, the other side, if you go to the other side, we're going to fade it in. I'm going to be playing this. And it's going to fade it in. I'm going to make it more obvious. I'm going to play it. No modulation. And slowly grows, grows, and grows. Until we get the full modulation. All right. So I'm going to go to no fade for now. What is the next thing? So we need to talk about the waves. Now, uh, the waves are pretty simple. So they're cool. You know, we have a cool, you know, cool waveforms. If I go to the wave, we have a sine wave, which is the default. Then I'm going to go all the way down. We have a triangle. We have a sine wave. We have a square, which is the on and off type of vibe. I'm going to go maybe down on that one. Uh, you have the uh, saw down, it starts up and then goes down. If you keep going, you have this one, which is Expo, which is pretty much like the other one, but it's just, you know, a little bit less aggressive. It has a tiny curve. If I keep going, you have the ramp up, which is the opposite of the saw. And uh, last but not least, le least is going to be the random. Right? So again, just super simple. You have all your different waveforms. And you, uh, you know, you just can use them. So then you have this control, and this control is going to be the start face. So as soon as I, uh, you know, move it, it's going to be changing where it's going to be starting. And I'm maybe going to need to give you a better example. I'm going to go to maybe the... I'm going to go to the sin, and I'm going to go to the tune. So I'm going to be working with the pitch. If I play it, notice that it goes up and down in pitch. Maybe I'm going too aggressive. I'm going to do something like this. All right, and I'm going to go to the filter and just, all right, so that's a little bit better. So as soon as I play it, it's going up and down in pitch. Now, notice what, what happens is that sometimes it's going to start slow. I'm going to go slower. 
Ah, that's fine. I'm going to go slower on this one. All right, that's cool. Goes up, down, up, and down in pitch. I notice that sometimes it's going to start up and sometimes it's going to be down. I'm going to be using a square. That's going to be a little bit more obvious. All right? Sometimes I'm going to be playing it. It's going to start up in pitch or sometimes it's going to be down. Right? So it's not super consistent. And it's because, by default, the mode is going to be that it's free. So the oscillator is uh, running free behind the scenes. It doesn't care when I press the key, when I'm triggering the LFO. Now, the next option is going to be the trigger. So this one cares about when I'm, you know, playing the synth. So as soon as I play it, notice that every time I play it, starts on the same place. It's very consistent. Starts up in pitch and not down. As soon as I hold it, it goes down because, you know, it's following whatever instruction. So this is where the phase come in. So if I use something like that, notice that we get something like that. So maybe instead of, I'm going to go maybe to a, uh, this is a better example. As soon as I play it, it starts up and then goes down. Now maybe I don't want to start up. I want to start in a different point. So I'm going to be starting right at the middle. It's going to go down and then up. This is why you change the face. Right? So you're starting from different points in the LFO. Right? That's pretty cool. Maybe we can do something like that. Right. So this is why you would use, uh, you know, the face. Now, it still works on the other one. The thing is that the other one, uh, since it's running free, is a little bit more, you know, inconsistent to, you know, catch. So the hold, so this is the hold mode. And maybe I'm going to go again right here. So the hold, what it will do, and it's uh, pretty weird, but it's super cool. So when a note is triggered, the LFO uh, uh, output level is going to be latched and just, you know, it's holding it. So every time that I just play, we are going to get different variations of that. And it's a super interesting. It's not a super common type of LFO. Right? But, you know, it's nice. It's cool. So I'm going to go to this one. And this one is the one. So this is one shot. It means that it's going to be trigger, tr triggering this one single time and then just die. So if I play it, it does it once and then it dies. Even though I'm holding it. Okay, so I had to get a new battery for the camera. So the next one is going to be health. Now, uh, on the other ones, maybe if I go to this one, that's going to be re-triggering. The, notice that the motion of the pitch, and if I maybe go to a sine wave, is up and down, up and down. It goes to up in pitch and then down in pitch. Now, this one is going to be half. So it's going to be going up in pitch and then staying right there. And you can see right there the icon, you know, the uh, drawing, how it goes up and then stays right there. It's not going into negatives. Right, so that's pretty much it. So that's it, you know, that's the whole LFO. Uh, you get two LFOs uh, on each track. So you can do one thing on this one, on the LFO one number one. And then when you go to the number two, you can do something completely, you know, different. Okay, so if you learned uh, something new and you liked all of this, remember to like and subscribe. And if you have the money and you want to buy me a coffee just to say thanks, you can go to the links at the description. You have links for PayPal, you have Patreon, and you have uh, YouTube thanks. Maybe you can be a one month Patreon and just maybe, you know, buy me a coffee that way. That would be cool. All right, so see you on the next one.